Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to night number two, Friday night, indeed. I so hope, hope y'all are having a great Friday night. Uh, it's the weekend, y'all, and that's all that matters, I think, at this point. Uh, welcome to the virtual star party, the Texas virtual Texas star party 2021. Uh, I think most of y'all can figure out why we're having a virtual star party instead of an in-person one uh, yet again in 2021. But alas, we are here. We've got a night packed full of awesome, fun stuff, guys. It's going to be great. We've got trivia, giveaways, uh, talks, all kinds of really fascinating stuff tonight. It's 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 just an awesome thing. Uh, my name is Will. I'll be one of two hosts tonight uh, kind of doing things uh, for you guys. Uh, you can find me at my social media at Deep Sky Dude right there. And to my left or right or whichever it is on my screen, I don't even know anymore. Uh, Mr. Joe Califf, the president of the Houston Astronomical Society. You can find him at the Astro Joe right there. Joe, another night, man. How's it going, buddy? I'm uh, looking forward to this. Last night was an absolute blast. We went late into the night. We went really late, uh, but it was fun every hour that we were there. Tonight, we've got another wonderful schedule um, of, of guests and, and trivia giveaways and things like that. So I'm looking forward to kicking off the party here, Will. Yeah, you know, we go late into the night as astronomers. That's how it goes because astronomy in the daytime, you can only look at one star. Um, yeah. So, but at, at nighttime, you can look at all the other ones. Uh, and But they're both fascinating. Don't, so, you know, I'm not trying to play favorites or anything. But uh, <laughs> one, one thing, oh, thank you, Celsa. You rock. Uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, and all of y'all watching out there, I see some familiar faces in the crowd. They're all avatars, but they're faces nonetheless. Right. Uh, appreciate all y'all hanging out with us. All of our advertisers and friends, Sky and Telescope, uh, Celestron, Explore Scientific, uh, the Houston Astronomical Society is helping us out. Uh, lot, so many people, and we were going to go through all that as we go tonight. Um, and basically, I think uh, what we should do now, Joe, is we'll probably go ahead and plug the dates for 2022. If you want ultra dark skies, West Texas, uh, and do the Texas Star Party next year, those are the dates. So. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Joe. Are you ready? I'm ready. I, I'm excited. You know, I, I wish it was tonight, but, uh, you know, this is the next best thing to actually being there. Uh, you know, looking forward to April 24th of next year. It can't get here soon enough. You know, the good thing is it looks like we're turning a corner. Things are starting to look better. And uh, barring any, you know, anything kind of unforeseen or a massive meteor strike or anything like that, we should be out in beautiful West Texas next April. I agree. Yeah. And so there's the dates, y'all get ready to uh, get ready to register, which is, you know, coming up uh, in like the November time frame or so. Right. Yeah, it'll be here before y'all know it. I promise you. Uh, so but get ready for that coming up and just mark your calendar right now. Get the days into your boss. Be like, hey, I'm I'm out of work these days. So uh, go ahead and give me those days off. It's requested off now, right? There's no harm in doing that. So. <laughs> yeah, it's early. Get it in early. You'll be there hanging out with us on the upper, middle, or lower field, whichever you want. So uh, those are the dates. And uh, and Joe, you know, Explore Scientific uh, is is helping us with this event, basically, you know. And so they've got a little an intro video. I think we should let them handle this next segment. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to their intro. Hey everybody, Scott Roberts and Kent Martz here from Explore Scientific, and we're at the world famous Texas Star Party. When are the dates again? The dates are June 10, 11, and 12 in the evenings. And you know, the Texas Star Party is one of the world's greatest star parties. Super dark skies out there in West Texas near Fort Davis. Uh, this is a star party that uh, a lot of us love to get to for deep sky observers, astrophotographers. It's beautiful uh, and a really friendly staff. We think you'll love it. The, uh, the main thing about the Texas Star Party is, is that, um, you know, the camaraderie. You've been to the Texas Star Party. I haven't been to the Texas Star Party. I've, been, out, I've been to McDonald Observatory in Fort Davis, oh, okay. Davis, but I've never been out there. Right. But folks, it's dark out there. If you ever get a chance, you need to make the trip. That's right. Yeah. We'll see you there. We're here for the virtual event, and we'll be showing you lots of stuff. Stay tuned. I see the comment, Kent and Scott, true cowboys. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they're dressed for the part, right? If nothing yeah. else. Uh, you know, it's it's a wonderful welcome that we got from them. They've been wonderful supporters of this whole event, and uh, we couldn't do it without the help of the Explore Scientific folks. And, uh, you know, they alluded to something in that video that is yes. absolutely true. You know, I think what separates 
the Texas Star Party from all the other star parties out there is the camaraderie. Um, you know, it's, it's wonderful being out there with 600 of your closest friends under really dark skies in the magical West Texas Big Bend area. And, uh, you know, for those of you who've never been out to Big Bend, uh, it is unlike any other place in the world. Uh, when, when you're out there, you're thinking, hey, I'm going to this desolate desert place. There's so much to do. And uh, what we do at the Texas party, at Star Party really doesn't happen unless we're in the Big Bend region. So, Will, I figured we would share something with folks to let them know really what Big Bend was all about. Let's do it. There's an old adage by William Blakely that says, Texas is neither Southern nor Western. Texas is Texas. And for anyone who's been to the Lone Star State, they know that the different parts of Texas are just as varied from one another as we are from our neighbors across our borders. Whether you're deep in the thicket of the Piney Woods, in the lush marshes of the Gulf Coast, in the plains of the Panhandle, or on the limestone cliffs and caverns that can be found in the hill country. Texas landscape is more varied than those of many countries, but no region seems to capture the true essence of what Texas is more than Big Bend. Though people may think of West Texas as a desolate place, it's a destination that folks come from around the world to visit. Big Bend National Park saw almost half a million visitors in 2019 alone, with people coming in from all corners of the world to take part in world-class hiking, biking, water activities, or to take in the natural beauty that is like no other place in the world. Big Bend also boasts some of the best dining destinations and international festivals anywhere around. But for astronomers, the Big Bend region is unique and unlike any other in the United States. When the sun goes down, this landscape is transformed into something that cannot be described until you've looked up into the Big Bend night sky and gotten lost in the heavens above. Very few places boast skies as dark as they are here, and on a cloudless, moonless night, the Milky Way can shine bright and stretch from horizon to horizon. And as the song Deep in the Heart of Texas goes, the stars at night are big and bright, and nowhere is that more true than here. For those looking to peer through their telescopes in order to unlock the mysteries of the cosmos, Big Bend is more than just an international destination, but rather, it's our gateway to the universe. It, it truly is a beautiful area out there, man. I think you really captured that in that piece, dude. Great job. Yeah, I appreciate that, Will. And, you know, anybody who goes out there for the Texas part, Star Party, the first time they're there, they look up at that night sky. It's amazing just how many stars there are and how easy it is, even for somebody like me or you who knows the night sky, to just absolutely get lost in the, uh, in the dark skies there. So it's a wonderful, beautiful place. Yeah, even a seasoned observer like Larry Mitchell couldn't find Virgo the first couple of times. <laughs> hey, I know. I, I didn't feel so bad the first time I went. I couldn't find the Big Dipper. So yeah, what, 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 <laughs> what is that? You know, yeah. So, and th that's why we go out to the Texas Star Party. That whole area, the Big Bend, West Texas area is a beautiful place. If you haven't been out there, uh, you're not doing yourself any favors. It's really, really cool. And uh, Joe's video is is a great uh, capturing of that. But y'all, tonight we have a lot of crazy, awesome stuff going on. We've got the one and only Stephen J. O'Meara on with us tonight. And um, he's going to talk to us about uh, astronomy in Botswana. Yes. And um, most of you are like, what? Like, just wait. You'll, I promise you it's going to blow your mind. And we also have Dr. Carl Gebhardt, Joe. He's going to be live with us in the broadcast studio. So wow. looking forward to hearing from him. He's doing a lot of fantastic work with the Hobby Eberly Telescope. 
so that they can uh, you know, figure out why the universe is expanding as quickly as it is. So that should be a wonderful, wonderful talk. So stick around for that tonight. Yeah, and uh, I think you know probably what we should do now is, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, it's, it's central time. We should probably get on Texas Star Party time. What do you think, Joe? Uh, I think it's TSP time. Let's do it. I feel it. I think we're I on, do too. I think we're on Texas Star Party time. And for those of y'all that are wondering, those are clips taken by myself and others of the Texas Star Party while it was happening. Uh, and you can do that too. You just have to go, you know, and bring your iPhone or something to film it with. Uh, and you too can have video of the Texas Star Party, which is an amazing place, Joe. I, you know, again, we're doing this because we love the Texas Star Party. Right. We miss being out there. And uh, but we've got some fun stuff, man. We've got um all kinds of guests we've talked about that and uh i think we're gonna do a trivia thing uh at some point tonight right joe maybe we'll yeah. do it right now I don't know. you know one of the things about uh tsp that i love the most besides from the dark skies the awesome telescopes and everything else are the prize giveaways and so we figured hey how do we bring that kind of experience to everybody online and we figured we'd do a trivia contest giveaway so what we wanted to do tonight to get everybody in the mood is get you uh ready with with a practice quiz basically so uh we're going to do this practice quiz anybody who's got a smartphone smart device or even your laptop can participate in this we want as many people jumping in as possible remember this is just the practice quiz we want everybody to get used to what this is like set down a few ground rules so we can make sure prizes go uh, to the to the appropriate winners and then you know just have fun so this practice quiz has two questions and I want as many of you folks in here to participate as possible so that you get that hang for it, right? So what I want you to do as we go in here is uh, we'll go over the rules real quick. You're going to be prompted to log in. Um, it may give you a name like Metal or something else like that. Please put your real name in there so that we know who to get the prizes to. Don't just click join quiz or put something cute in there. Um, use your real name. Last night, we decided to go with 15 seconds for each question. Tonight, we've upped it up to 20 seconds per question. So you have 20 seconds to answer each question. If you get the question right, you get points. If you don't get it right, you don't get any points. However, because there are going to be a lot of people participating, the more quickly you answer the points, the more, or the question, I should say, the more points you actually get. So faster answers, get more points. Uh, if you take a little bit longer to answer, you'll still get points, but not as much as those who answered more correctly. And even though at the very end we're going to show the winner, the top three places get a prize tonight. So hang in there. We're going to get through the contest, and then we'll announce the top three winners at the very end of, uh, after afterwards, and that uh, should be a blast. So is everybody ready? 
I'm ready, Joe. I don't know about you. All <laughs> right. <laughs> no, and, I am ready. So. <laughs> and I just so, put the Minty code in all the chat rooms. So it's uh, right there. It's also at the top of the screen, right, Joe? 3906 0165. That's it. So two ways to join. You can go to menti.com through a browser and use the code 39060165, like you mentioned, Will, or just open up your camera app if you've got a modern smartphone or something like that. Uh, scan that QR code. That should give you an option to go to that link directly. So we want as many of you folks jumping in here as possible. I see uh, we've got about a dozen folks in here right now. Let's get uh, give a little more time for folks to jump in. I see and, the heart coming up. Yeah, I think. That yeah, means- yeah, absolutely. Nice. And yeah, we, we want to give everybody a chance to play. So, you know, it's just a browser based thing. You log in, and give us the real name. And get- We're not going to be tracking the real comments. You want to be able to get guys to you when you win. So, there are man, lots of cool emojis popping in. Absolutely. So, one of the things that we're going to do, uh, I guess we'll just jump into it again. This is the practice quiz, so we want uh, as many of you folks to, to get used to it. If you're used to it already, cool, then, then be ready to go when we do the real trivia quiz. So, we're going to re- uh, jump in right now. You ready, Will? I am ready. All right. So, if you participated last night, these might be uh, familiar questions, but what state is the Texas Star Party held in? Hmm. Hawaii, Texas, Chile, or giraffe? The state of giraffe. State of giraffe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you have five seconds left to answer. Get those answers in. Time's up. And everybody got it right this time. Last night we actually had somebody get it wrong. So, yes, te- Texas is the home of the Texas Star Party. Glad everybody was, was able to get that. Yeah. I was wondering, yeah. <laughs> and you'll see uh, at the end of these questions, we'll get a leaderboard. So who answered this the, uh, the fastest? Looks like it was Kelly Miller. So by uh, by result of answering the, the most uh, the, the quickest. Kelly gets the most points, so 975 points. All right, here comes question number two. Anyone faster to answer gets more points. Who is the Hubble Space Telescope named after? Who is the Hubble Space Telescope named after? Is it Neil Armstrong, Albert Einstein, Kim Kardashian, or Edwin Hubble? Oh, wow, I thought it was Tom Hanks. No, that's a common mistake, though. Right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Time's up. Edwin Hubble. Somebody did get... Okay. There's a wise yeah. guy in the, uh, the room All there. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the way it goes, right? Um, we'll go ahead and advance slide here. We'll see who the winner of the test quiz is. And after it tabulates all the points here, looks like Debbie Moran is yep. the winner. Congratulations, Debbie. Our good friend Debbie Moran is the winner. Unfortunately, we're not giving away a prize here, right? But, uh, you know, everybody hopefully gets a chance to figure out how this thing works and it's going to be ready to go when we do the real thing in just a little while. Right. Yeah. And so get those fingers ready because uh, the fingers, web browsers, whatever you got, because we're going to be doing that a little bit later in the show. So you're going to want to stick around. And uh, we also have all kinds of other giveaways like door prizes and stuff, Joe, which is exciting. And um, I don't know. Where do we go next, buddy? Yeah, you know, Texas Star Party is our favorite star party by far. But we also wanted to kind of give a salute to the other star parties that are out there, right? So I figured we just uh, a quick nod to those others that are uh, upcoming. And hopefully, if you've got some time, you can give one of those uh, star parties a visit as well. So first off, August 1st through the 6th is the Nebraska Star Party. Well, you and I kind of talked about this last night. We did. Uh, this place is, I've never been, and I think you said you've never been either, but this place no. is renowned for its dark skies and is a, uh, a wonderful star party as well. So for anybody interested in going in early August, uh, NebraskaStarParty.org is a place to get more information. The Oregon Star Party is going to happen uh, shortly thereafter, August 3rd through the 8th, 2021. You can get more details over at OregonStarParty.org. And then the world famous cellophane convention is August 5th through the 9th. So it looks like everybody else is getting started in early August there. Oh, yeah. Uh, Registration is now open. So if you want to register for that, go to cellophane.org and get all the information and registration and content that you need. And then, Will, one of your favorites, not the Texas Star Party, but uh, one of your other favorites is the Okie Tech Star Party. That's right. And that's going to be coming up in early October. Want to share a few things about Okie Techs? It's dark. 
and um, <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, go to Oki Text. That's what I'll say. Absolutely. So that's coming up October 1st through the 9th, 2021. Oki-text.com for more details. The Enchanted Sky Star Party. Uh, again, dark, yeah. another dark place happening in early October. So hopefully by then it's getting a little cooler at night. Uh, EnchantedSkies.org for more details there. Well, another one of our favorites. This is the last star party that both you and I attended That's uh, right. initially uh, yeah. last year. Uh, but the El Dorado Star Party is happening in early November. Actually, my birthday is going to be. Uh, in the middle there. So that that's a good reason to go celebrate my birthday. There you go. But, uh, <laughs> but eldoradostarparty.org is the place to get more information. Winter Star Party, our friends down in Florida uh, did a wonderful job of doing the Winter Star Party online this year. But uh, I've never been myself. I've heard the seeing is fantastic thanks to uh, the the, uh, the ocean right there. But that's going to be going on early next year, January 31st to February 6th. And then Last but not least, our favorite, the yes. Texas Star Party. The one, and only. <laughs> the one and only, as Will had mentioned earlier, is going to be happening April 24th through May 1st, 2022. So Uh go ahead and get that loaded up in your browsers because we're going to talk about a lot of things that uh, you can see on the website tonight. Uh, but we're looking forward to that next year as well. So that's yeah. uh, just a quick nod to some of our favorite star parties there, Will. You know, and they're and they're all great. Uh, it, it's it's always a challenge to figure out if it's going to work with the schedule and the logistics of getting all your gear out into the middle of nowhere because that's where the darkest skies are. But I I can promise y'all that it's something that you should do, um, even if you only ever get to go to a couple of star parties a year or one. Uh, it's going to enhance your visual observing. It's going to enhance your astrophotography. It's going to enhance your connections that you make in the field. Uh, it's like, like I said earlier, it's the camaraderie. So get out to these star parties, y'all. It really will make you a better astronomer, a better amateur astronomer, whatever you want to call yourself. So just get out there with us and uh, we'll hang. We'll hang out. Yeah. A lot of people show up. They bring a telescope and they never look through their telescope. They're looking through other people's telescopes, which is right. one of the nice things about these star parties. That's right. Yeah. And so and one of the cool things about all these star parties or most of the star parties, I guess, is they they all have door prizes. You know, yes. um, a lot of people will stick to the end no matter the conditions. So then off chance they win a, a star chart from someone or something, a red flashlight or whatever. And I've been one of those people for the Okie Tech Star Party 2018, I believe it was. It rained the entire star party, uh, which was fun. Uh, but at the very end, there was a bunch of us that went to the giveaway because uh, and you could tell that there was a lot of people that just stayed just to, to, to try to win. I didn't win anything that year, though. So it was kind of a, uh, you know, it's kind of sad, but uh, a little bummer. Yeah. So we've got some winners tonight for the star. Do. Now, the way this uh, the door prizes work for this is if you were basically um, registered for 2019, 2020 and 2021, if you registered on the website for the Texas star party, you're automatically entered to win this giveaway. Okay. Uh, this is a way for us to give some of the fun stuff to our TSP regulars, the people that would have been out there in the, in the uh, deserts of West Texas and uh, a little nod to our friends here uh, that we go hang out with. So this isn't a necessarily a crowd participation giveaway, but we do have some winners, Joe. And I think uh, we may have, some info on that. Here. Yeah, absolutely. So you hit the nail on the head, Will. Uh, usually the Saturday night, the last Saturday night of the star party is when we have the big giveaway. We're going to have more giveaways tomorrow. So be, be sure to stay tuned uh, for that and join us tomorrow night. But um, we'll kind of touched on these things. If you were registered in, uh, for to attend TSP in 2019 through 2021, you're automatically registered to win. It's a double random blind drawing. Uh, a lot of stuff happened in the background to make that happen. Uh, registration list based on those years, 2019 through 2021, is randomized and sorted. And the prize list itself is randomized and sorted. And we put all of that together and we've got some giveaways. So first door prize of the night is a uh, Hubble Optics Hubble Five Star Artificial Star uh, donated to us graciously by Hubble Optics. And the winner of that is Christian Wade of Kansas City, Missouri. All right. Congratulations, Christian. Absolutely. All right. The next door prize is a $50 Amazon gift card donated to us by the Texas Star Party themselves. So the winner of this $50 Amazon gift card is our good buddy, Tom Weidman from Great Rides, Texas. Look yeah. at that. Tom Weidman, our good buddy. 
the Weidmans clean up at star party. <laughs> they win everything. If you're some people party, have all the luck, I guess. Right? If you're at a star party with these guys, don't even play the giveaway. You're not going to win. They're going to win it all. I promise. Just <laughs> take them to Las Vegas right afterwards, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's very lucky. That's awesome, Tom. But, bro, just split it with me, okay, Tom? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Next door prize is a $50 AstroZap e-gift certificate. So anybody who's got telescopes, astronomy equipment, you need accessories. And AstroZap is a wonderful manufacturer and provider of those accessories. And the winner of this prize is... Richard Bell, our good friend, Richard Bell, who's the president of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. Awesome. Uh, congratulations, Richard. Very cool. Presidents all around. All right. And door prize number 15. It already shows it there. A gift certificate for remote observer, uh, remote observing. Uh, winner's choice of either three hours of DSO time on a 50 millimeter, 500 millimeter, excuse me, aperture scope or two hours of DSO time on a one meter aperture scope. Wow. Wow. Or one hour of planetary imaging on a one meter scope. The winner of that is James Bardsley of Franklin, Tennessee. James, congratulations. I am jealous. I am, I am jealous. jealous. <laughs> and uh, thanks go out to our, um, one of our advertisers, Chile Scope, for providing this wonderful gift. And uh, James, I'm sure you're going to uh, really enjoy that. That's incredible. Okay. We're not done yet. Door prize number 16. Uh, Another $50 AstroZap e-gift cer gift certificate. Um, I am kind of want one of these myself, right? Right. <laughs> AstroZap makes some awesome stuff. And the winner is George Lutch of North Richland Hills, Texas. Congratulations, George. George. Yeah, congrats, George. He's a, a, a longtime TSP person and a good friend of ours. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. All right. Door prize number 17. Donated by one of our great partners through this whole event, Sky and Telescope. Sky and Tel has been absolutely wonderful, magnificent, letting us uh, use their platform to stream. Uh, but they're also donating a Sky and Telescope Pocket Sky Atlas. And if you don't have one of those, it's indispensable. You've got to have one. But one lucky person tonight doesn't need to go out and buy it. They're going to get one for free. And that's Adam Gillard. I'm hope I hope I pronounced that correctly in Bloomington, Minnesota. So this is going all the way to the northern part of the continental 40, uh, nice. US here, the lower 48. Yeah, yeah congratulations. Awesome. And last but not least, door prize number 18 here Ooh. is a $50 Amazon gift card donated by, hey, we got some folks that we know down at the Houston Astronomical Society. Just a few. Just a few. And the winner of this prize is Bill Drelling. From Alameda, California. So we're covering all parts of the United States tonight. Uh, coast coast drilling. There you go. Congratulations. And we'll reach out to everybody who's won a prize tonight to make sure that uh, these prizes get in the right hands. So really Absolutely. excited about that. Yeah. Congrats to all of our uh, door prize winners. One thing I do want to mention right here at the end of that is uh, that you can get these amazing shirts that we are wearing right now that Joe and I have on our producer, Don Sully is in the, in the background. He's wearing his shirt, even though he's not on camera, he's got it on. This is a nice, comfortable shirt, man. I'm telling you, it's good quality. Uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's an awesome design. Chris and Christine Ober and Tara Krasansky, our t-shirt designers did a great job. Basically you go to T uh, Texas star and then you can, uh, find the t-shirt, uh, online order. You fill it out and uh, tell them what size and send in your money. And uh, you you too can have one of these t-shirts that we have. Uh, I know that, like I said, Joe and I have ours on. Uh, it's great stuff. We'll be wearing them for three days straight, washing them in between, I hope, Joe. I hope. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you guys can get those there. Don't sleep on these. These won't be available forever. And um, it'll, be a, it'll be a way for us to, in 2022, when we all show up on T-shirt day with our uh, with our COVID shirts on, it, it'll be a cool way to be like, yeah, we were on the the thing with each other. Awesome. So uh, get those, uh, and we'll be mentioning those again as time goes on. So that's right, that's right. And uh, Will, I think we also have a, a few other things that were donated to us that were given away as auction prizes, right? We do, and the auction is ongoing. So if you're not bidding, you're not doing yourself any favors here, y'all. The VST VTSP auction is on right now and i believe i have a banner with the website here yeah there we go there's the website right there texasstarparty.betterworld.org slash auctions slash vtsp auctions 
Uh, maybe if Don can hit the, uh, the chat with that link so people could click on it. Basically what this is, uh, we have two auctions going on right now. Uh, I'll scroll down to them. We have a premium stay, uh, premium cabin uh, stay at the X Bar Ranch. It's a $500 value, guys. Uh, three days, two nights at one of their cabins of your choice. That's an amazing gift. I can tell y'all that I've been there many, many times, and yeah. uh, it's definitely worth bidding on. If you don't win, hey, whatever. If you do win, dude, you're going on vacation. Uh, and the other one is the one and only Prude Ranch, where we normally have the Texas Star Party. Uh, it's a winter weekend stay at the Prude Ranch. Again, two nights, uh, three days uh, at uh, one of their facilities there at the Prude Ranch in the mountains of West Texas, y'all. Yes. Amazing place. Bid on this because you could win and you could get an amazing deal on uh, an awesome weekend. Uh, I don't know, Joe. I'm, I'm thinking I might have to bid just to, you know, just to do it. Well, I don't know either. <laughs> Actually, I do know. Uh, I'm bidding on both of them. So, you yes. know, th these are the places where we have the Texas Star Party and the El Dorado Star Party. Again, some of the darkest skies in the lower 48. And, uh, you know, why not take advantage of that when one of these uh, uh, stays and uh, take your telescopes out and enjoy the night sky there? That's right. Yeah. And our friend Don, uh, our producer in the background, who's helped us so much with this, Don, thank you again. Of course, he has dropped the link in all the platforms there. So that's the link. Go and bid on this stuff. And uh, if you outbid me, I'll be upset. But I bet Joe will be the one who outbids me in the end. No, no. But whoever wins, uh, you know, Will and I are willing to sleep on the front porch, if that's okay, wherever you're at. So. Um, yeah, good luck to everybody bidding on those things. Even if you don't ask, we'll probably be out there anyway. So <laughs> um, definitely check on those. And um, so, yeah. And I mean, I guess what we should do, you know, Joe, we should probably give away something to the people here that are live right now with us on all the different platforms, whether it be Absolutely. what Explorer Scientific, we've got uh, Deep Sky Dude, my platform. We've got the Astro Joe, which is your platform, Sky and yep. Telescope. Houston Astronomical Society, I said Explorer Scientific. Uh, we've got a lot of platforms we're broadcasting out to. And uh, Joe found us an awesome way to give away cool things like one of these T-shirts. And I think that's what we're going to give away now. Joe, why don't you tell us how we how we do it, man? Yeah. So what we're going to do is, is use the hashtag Explore Scientific. We want to give a nod out to our good buddies over at Explore Scientific. But uh, on whatever platform you're on, all the ones that Will listed, Put in ex uh, hashtag explore scientific anywhere there, and um, we'll start collecting all of those entries. And that's all you got to do. And we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to go ahead and get those explore scientific hashtag explore scientific uh, entries in. And uh, we'll just run a complete random drawing, and whoever wins gets one of these fantastic t shirts. Yeah. And a real quick thing the, um, while y'all are putting explore hashtag explore scientific in the chat, wherever you're at and you're getting, you're going to be entered to win. Uh, the auction does end in one day. Right. And I think, yes. uh, so it's at noon or is it, I can't remember exactly what, no. uh, 9 PM tomorrow night, so 9, 9 PM central tomorrow night. Make sure that you get, uh, those auction bids in and, uh, you know, like I said, these things are, are awesome. They're worth quite a bit. So whoever wins is going to be a pretty lucky person. And the thing is, you know, the proceeds go to the virtual Texas, excuse me, to the Texas Star Party so that we can continue to put on a wonderful event year after year. Yeah, that's right. And uh, that they were graciously donated by the two ranches that we have two star parties at the Prude Ranch, Texas Star Party, the X Bar Ranch, El Dorado Star Party. So thank you to the Prude. Thank you to the X Bar. Uh, yep. And so while you guys are getting your hashtag Explore Scientific uh, into the chat, I think we're going to uh, turn it over to our friends at Celestron and uh, let them, uh, we're going to hear from them for a second. When we come back, I think we might pick a winner, right, Joe? Yeah, I think uh, that should be enough time. Bear with me one second as I get this. Lots, of, I see, man, I see so many people dropping. Make sure you do it with no spaces, guys. I see a couple, uh, a couple with spaces in it. Make sure it's exactly as you see it on the screen. Otherwise, the, the algorithms won't know who picked what. So make sure, and you only get one. You can put 50 in there, but you only get one. You only get one. That's it. So we're going to yep. hear from our good friends over at Celestron. And when we get back from the break, we're going to go ahead and give that T-shirt away.
Ready for a new kind of telescope experience? Unlock the power of your smartphone to help you navigate the night sky. Introducing StarSense Explorer by Celestron. It's fast, easy, and accurate. In minutes, you're ready to take a guided tour of the universe. First, dock your smartphone and launch the StarSense Explorer app. Unlike other astronomy apps, StarSense Explorer aligns precisely with your telescope and uses sky recognition technology to pinpoint its exact position in the night sky. Follow the simple instructions, and in seconds, the app generates a list of all the best objects currently visible in the night sky. Select an object from the list and follow the on-screen arrows to the desired object. As you move the telescope, StarSense Explorer recalibrates its position in real time. The bullseye turns green when your object is ready to view in the eyepiece. It's that simple. StarSense Explorer works anywhere in the world, no cell signal required. So whether you're in your backyard or a remote dark sky location, the universe is yours to explore. From the time it took Voyager to leave the Earth and reach the edge of the solar system, I went from being a baby to a high schooler to a university graduate to a worker to a business owner, and now I'm a husband, a father, a postgrad student, a science communicator, a musician, a YouTuber, and a backyard astronomer. I've been lucky to reach this point to be able to buy some of the best equipment an amateur astronomer could dream of. But there's one thing I can't afford, and that's time. Astronomy has made me a more patient person, and the constant drive to get better and collect more data to capture the wonder of the cosmos is something I have to balance with everything else in my life. So when I see a telescope with a lower F number, I know that its value to me is far greater than money alone. A telescope's value is not just the sum of its parts. It comes from how much you can get it outside, and how much you can get out of it. That's why I jumped to buy the Celestron Roacum and Schmidt Astrograph 11. It's 620mm focal length that F2 allows me to capture the incredible Southern Hemisphere Nebulae, sometimes within a single night, but always with revealing depth and signal. I've been shooting the universe with the RASA 11 for years now, and it's allowed me not only the satisfaction of sharing these unique views from my end of the world, but also to detect and track asteroids, which is an area I'd love to explore further. The RASA 11 easily crosses that divide, between a consumer scope and a scientific research grade observational telescope for discovery and analysis. The real limit for the RASA 11 is really how far I'm willing to take it. And it's nice to have a telescope that I won't outgrow for a long time. Because time is the only thing we don't get more of. Awesome ad segment by Celestron. Thank you guys over at Celestron. Such a great company, man. It's a it's a household name. Uh, just a company you know when you buy it, it's going to be good quality stuff. And uh, I've never that's never been the case, you know, that I haven't had a good quality piece when I bought it from Celestron. So love and like Tom Weidman says, love our Celestron Next YZ, man. That thing was the when I saw that come out, mm -hmm. I was like, this is it? I I love iPhone astrophotography. I'm done. This is my the last mount, and it's the first one I bought. It's still the one I have. It's amazing. 
I bought a lot of things before that for astro, uh, iPhone astrophotography, and none of them work nearly as well as the uh, next YZ. I'm kind of curious. You used that Star Sentence Explorer yet? I've heard wonderful things about it. Uh, the yeah, well, yes, actually, I have one of those little scopes, and yeah. uh, it is unbelievably cool. I, I'm saying that as a person who has a 22 inch Dobsonian. Uh, th when when you put your iPhone on there, it's plate solving. It's yes. plate solving on your iPhone and it is incredible. You can nudge the scope and you see that reaction on your yeah. phone with the star chart. Absolutely amazing. Uh, it's definitely something y'all should look into if you're a beginner or if you're just an expert and you want to wow the crowd at a, at an outreach event. It's amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's time to give away a t-shirt. So for those who haven't jumped in, whatever platform you're on, enter hashtag explore scientific and uh, get your entry in for a chance to win one of these wonderful Texas Star Party 2021 t-shirts. Yeah. So, well, I think uh, I think we're ready, huh? I think we have to pick somebody. I think, I think, all the, I think it's the comments are in. I think somebody's going to win a t-shirt, uh, and we'll see what happens. Here we go. Here we go. Look at all the names. All those names coming in, and it's going to settle in on one person, and that person is going to win a t-shirt. That person is... I wish we had a drum roll. Salsa. Salsa. Our good All friend right. Salsa. Congratulations. Good friend of ours and a member of the uh, Houston Astronomical Society, if I'm not mistaken. Very awesome. She is. Absolutely. So, Salsa, if you wouldn't mind, uh, email us at VTSP. Let's go ahead and flash that banner down there at the bottom. There. Uh, I've got it somewhere. Uh, there it is. There it is. Salsa, if you could email us at VTSP at TexasStarParty.org. Uh, give us some information about your T-shirt size, your address, things like that. We'll make sure to get that T-shirt in your hand. So congratulations once again, Elsa. Amazing. Amazing. I'm Amazing. So exactly. <laughs> so, it's so fun to give away stuff. You know, I got a free shirt, so why can't I pay that forward? I, and pro I promise you, Elsa, it won't be this shirt. So you don't have to worry about that. It'll be a, a whole different shirt. Never worn. Promise. <laughs> Fred, like I said yesterday. These are fresh off the runways in Milan and Paris. So it's it's the summer's hottest fashion. <laughs> High quality threads, yeah. <laughs> um, so hey, we talked about uh, Celestron earlier, another one of our uh, sponsors, wonderful partner out there, and the manufacturer of exquisite astronomical equipment. Uh, you and I talked about the eyepieces that we have uh, from Explore Scientific and how they're just top notch. You can compare, uh, put them up against anybody and they hold their own. Well, I figured uh, we'd share some of that goodness about Explore Scientific with other folks as well. So pay attention Can't to uh, this. Today we're going to talk about the Apochromatic series of telescopes from Explore Scientific. The Apo series of telescopes have three pieces of glass in the front that provide great visual and astrophotography opportunities for the amateur astronomer. They range in size from the ED80 all the way up to the FPL 53 165 millimeter telescope. They come in the classic white tube as well as the spectacularly beautiful carbon fiber tube. There's three levels of glass. FCD1, which is the Essential Series, the FCD100 Series, and the FPL53 Series of glass. Each one has their own benefits. They are all great for visual and astrophotography. For more details and to purchase these telescopes, go to explorescientific.com. Yeah, and again, those are those are great scopes, man. My ED one hundred and two, uh, which is apochromatic. Yeah, yeah, right, right. A yeah, acromat, acro apo. Yeah, apo is the way to go, y'all. So, uh, it you know they're worth it. I promise you, they're worth it. Yeah, wonderful scopes, wonderful eyepieces. Uh, good folks that run that company, and uh, we're just really thankful for their uh, partnership in this whole thing. And give them a, a, a shout out. They do a lot of great stuff for the astronomical community as well. So. Absolutely. Well, I'm uh, I, I'm really excited about our first speaker tonight. Uh, you and I had the opportunity recently to sit down with none other than Stephen J. O'Meara and uh, talk to him about what astronomy in Botswana is like. And uh, Stephen is well known and probably uh, regarded as he is regarded as probably the best visual observer out there. He's done some pretty incredible things. Uh, with the telescope. And uh, I thought it was a fantastic interview. How about you, Will? Yeah, it was amazing to be sitting in the same online room with Steve. Yes. Uh, and just to hear his, hear his talk that, you know, in that context. And I mean, 
it's just amazing. The guy is is a legend, uh, especially amongst us visual observers. Yes. Discovering the spokes of Saturn's rings before we discovered the spokes of Saturn's rings. I mean, come on, y'all. That's like ridiculous uh, abilities there. And uh, he's in Botswana, Africa, yes. doing some southern sky observing in one of the darkest places on the planet, which I'm sure is just the worst, right? Like <laughs> an astronomer's nightmare being in the best place in the world for that. Uh, but no, it was a really awesome interview, and uh, it's just it's just so cool to be able to talk to him. If you've read Sky and Telescope at any point uh, in your astronomy career, you've probably read a, a, an article or two by Mr. Stephen J. O'Meara. So uh, I guess, Joe, do you have do you want to uh, just roll that or do we have? Yeah. Okay. All right, everybody, uh, thanks for joining us. And we've got a special treat today. We're joined by none other than Mr. Stephen J. O'Meara. And uh, most of you have probably heard of Stephen, but if you haven't, he is a renowned visual astronomer, uh, probably the greatest of our day. He's uh, recognized for his legendary eyesight and obs observational prowess. Among his many uh, astronomical achievements, Stephen was the first to sight Halley's Comet in its 1985 return and the first person to determine the rotation period of the distant planet Uranus. One of his most distinguished feats was the visual detecting, uh, detection of the mysterious spokes in Saturn's B-ring before the Voyager spacecraft imaged them. And I remember you telling us that story when you came yeah. to visit us at uh, the Houston Astronomical Society. People thought you were crazy and you, were end up, you ended up being vindicated there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stephen has been honored with several awards, including the prestigious Lone Stargazer Award for setting the standard yeah. of excellence in visual observing, the Omega Centauri Award for advancing astronomy through observation, writing, and promotion, and for sharing his love of the sky, and the Caroline Herschel Award for his planetary discoveries. The International Astronomical Union named Asteroid 3637 Omira in his honor. So we're pleased to have none other than Mr. Stephen Omira here with us. Stephen, thanks for joining. Yeah, you're welcome. And yes, I wish I could be there in person. I, I so miss the Texas Star Party. And I do guess, I hope we get have a chance to chat about our memories too later. Absolutely. Because th there's only pleasant memories. And um, I do have to say that personally, I even though this has nothing to do with Barbara Wilson, I'd like to dedicate this to her in her honor. So, uh, I yeah I miss her. She was she was a driving force um, among the visual observers there. So, but uh, today I'm going to be talking about Botswana in Africa, where I live, and I've been living here now for the last eight years. And I was asked to give a presentation because some people were curious about what the southern stars are like. Also, what am I doing here? Um, why am I here? and so on and so forth. So I thought I'd give you a little rundown as uh, as to what's going on in my life, because I'm now a Southern Hemisphere observer. Um, and first, the, I'd like to talk about where is Botswana? So we're in Southern Africa. And I think one of the most important things to understand and to distinguish is that we are in Southern Africa and not South Africa. We're an independent country. We have nothing to do with South Africa in the, in the way of government or policies or culture, et cetera. So we're no different than having United States and Mexico. You know, what are the similarities culturally? It's totally different. So, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but it's a beautiful country, safe. Um, here are some images that you might recognize. Uh, for some, the, the number one ladies detective agency book is set in Botswana. Uh, the Cry of the Kalahari by Mark and Delia Owens. Uh, it's all about uh, their, their life in Africa and the lions. And of course, the, the old film, The Gods Must Be Crazy with a Coke Bottle Falls Out of the Plane. <laughs> And it's a, a, a comedy, and that's also takes place in Botswana. Now, the interesting thing about Botswana um, is that it's mostly Kalahari Desert. And I have to admit that um, before I came to Botswana, I really, I, I admit, I did not know where it was. And 
I was living on the island of Hawaii. Now, here's something that I find interesting. I had no idea. Daniel Green um, at the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams emailed me and said, Steve, do you know that you're the, at the antipode of where you lived in Hawaii? So I lived in Volcano Hawaii, which was plus 19 degrees, and uh, Mount Botswana is minus 19 degrees. And not only that, they're essentially 180 degrees apart. And this is like down to the towns that we lived in. It's just amazing. And look at the similarities between the, the sizes of, of Botswana and the big island of Hawaii. So it's pretty incredible that I essentially moved 180 degrees away to the southern mirror site of, of where I lived. And in fact, you'll enjoy this too. Botswana is about as large as Texas. So also kind of a similar shape, isn't it? Yeah. If you think about it. I have, to, I have to add that for that one. Um, anyway, so this little red dot shows us where we live in northern Botswana. Now, the capital city is way down in the lower right, um, Gaborone, and it's way, way, way down on the edge of the, of the border. And you can see that most of the, the country is, as it says, Kalahari Desert. But up where we are, Maun, um, it's M-A-U-N, you see that green area. And so it's rainwater that comes down from Angola and filters through into a river system. And so Maun is the gateway to the Okavango Delta, which is a 1000 UNESCO World Heritage Site. So we're up almost about as high as probably the Texas Star Party. We're about 3,500 feet in altitude, flat as a pancake. So it's sort of like the Texas Star Party being held in Florida, but it's, uh, and in fact, the <laughs> Okavango uh, Delta has incredible similarities in the nature of the river as it does to the Everglades in Florida. Um, this is Mound. It's, a, it's a, um, not a highly populated um, area. We have one major international airstrip most of the people, we live along the, the river, this section called the Tamalakani River. And it's still in the Kalahari sands with the sand in, in our backyard, that's from the Kalahari. And just not far, um, we have elephants. You can just go 20 minutes outside of Mound and you're in the natural wildlife area. Um, and this is one mode of transportation to get to some sites across the river. And why am I here? Well, I met my future wife-to-be, Deborah Carter. And some of you may know Deborah as she was a, a Travel Quest Eclipse Tour coordinator. She's seen almost as many eclipses as I have, almost at least a dozen eclipses. And um, she's also a travel agent in a in a uh, yoga instructor, certified yoga instructor. So we met and then when I wanted to come and see her, she set up all the arrangements. And honestly, again, I didn't even know where Botswana was. I just got on a jet and I arrived. <laughs> now, but if anyone's thinking about travel to Botswana, I mean, to Botswana, Deborah is really the one to talk about. I just want to say one thing about her life is that um, many years uh before I met her, she's from England and she ran um, overland so in a truck, overlanded from England all the way through Africa. This is the route. I mean, they did this for many, many years, going through the Congo, the Algiers, the Sahara Desert, stories upon stories that she could tell you. Um, and so she knows Africa and she, uh, she ended up basically ultimately stopping the overlanding and then uh, became a travel agent in Botswana where she is today. And so now that we're together, we do yoga and stargazing safaris for people that are interested. In fact, we, uh, she organized with Sky and Telescope, we put together the Botswana stargazing safari, which in fact, we have one coming up in, um, in this, at the end of this month if anyone's interested. Um, and these, these have been uh, quite successful. Just to show you the type of animals that we have in Botswana, we have elephants, leopards, rhinos, Cape buffalo, hippos, jackals, leopards, 
cheetah, giraffes, kudu, that's that animal down there with the long horns, sables, giraffes, zebra, you name it. And it's all here. In fact, we're going tomorrow out to the bush again. And some of these are just common sites. For birders, we have saddlebill storks, uh, the wattle uh, crane, fish eagles, giant eagle owl, owls. That colorful bird at top is the um, lilac breasted roller. Some of these are endangered species, such as the ground hornbills at bottom, the skimmers, and so on. So the, it's quite it's quite a, a beautiful natural environment. Now we have basically three seasons in Botswana. We have, let's see, we have cold and dry, hot and dry, and then hot and wet. So mostly it's, it mostly we have dry, so either hot or it's cold. But even in the rainy season, it's been, it's been quite fantastic, uh, the atmospheric phenomena that we get to experience, especially in the flat, extensive plains. I mean, when the thunderstorms come, they're just like you, you find in a horror movie. It's just unending lightning and it just rolls un, unceasingly across, across the plains. And you can see some of the atmospheric phenomena that we have. And in the lower image middle, you see these really bizarre, uh, odd concentric rings around the sun. And that photo, all the others were my photos, but the one, that particular one was taken by a friend, uh, Shirley, who you see at lower right. She was out hanging her clothes and she just pulled out her phone. She looked up in the sky and there were these concentric rings. It's pretty, pretty amazing and pretty astute. But that's the one thing about the people of Botswana. They, they have keen eyesight and they're very astute. Now, as far as darkness is concerned, we're down there, that little red dot you see in Africa, in, in Southern Africa, that's where we are, as far as dark skies are concerned. Um, you can compare that to the United States and Central America and across Europe and Saudi Arabia and over into um, uh, to the East. And you can see that we have, we're in a very special location. And this is, for an example, a shot I took from our, our backyard. And this is just, a, a simple 50 millimeter lens, probably a 60 second exposure. Now, what am I doing here? Um, aside from, well, I now have my wife, Deborah, um, is in order before we were married, I had to get permission to be here and to stay here uh, on, on a special permit, filming permit and study, which was I wanted to study the Southern Stars and also to deal with the Basawa. Now they were the formerly called the San people and they were the original Aboriginal natives of Botswana and they still have, have, have tribes uh, throughout Botswana and I spent four years uh, dealing uh, and learning with them with interpreters to find out about the stars and their interpretations of the sky. Now, these are some photos I took of them in their natural habitat. They're original nomads. They are hunter gatherers. They still live this lifestyle. And they also are uh, shamans and they have trance dances where they, they mystically unite with the universe or, or with animals. Um, it's really fantastic to see and to experience um, the sand were also noted for their keen eyesight. In fact, there are studies done where um, they, they actually saw and had names for the individual moons of Jupiter. This is with the naked eye, this is <laughs> pre-telescopic. And they had names for the moons of Jupiter and they watched them dance around, around the, the fire of Jupiter. So pretty incredible eyesight and, and it's the, the Basara people who have that kind of skill are the ones that take you out when you go on these game drives, because they're the ones who, who can find and spot the animals even far away. Incredible eyesight. And some of the legends that I learned were, were fascinating. For example, the, the stars were the, the spirits of their relatives. And the brightest stars 
show their significance of their deceased, the importance that they had to the Basara people. The brighter ones were the more important ones, the fainter ones um, less important, and also the, they're the ones that had, that had died a long time ago and they're fading away in the sky. And they also had, just like the Aborigines of Australia and other Aboriginal cultures, they really focus their attention on dark nebulae. And here we have the giraffe. You can see the two composites that show um, the coal sack is the head of the giraffe and going down toward the heart of the Milky Way. And then there was one recent legend I heard about how the scorpion, the dark nebula, which is the, the river and the pipe nebula, uh, which trip, trips the giraffe when it's setting. <laughs> and so it falls into the into the earth. And their idea of the Milky Way itself is fascinating. They have several, several myths involving the Milky Way, including that there was a daughter who was left uh, to, to watch their camp um, while the hunter-gatherers went out at night. And so to give them a guiding light, she took the ashes from the fire and tossed them into the sky in order to create the Milky Way. And we, one time, it was really fascinating, I, I was able to get this shot of when we were visiting with them at one of their camps in the, in the bush. And here was their campfire and the smoke was trailing right off into the Milky Way. So you can really, you just saw the legend in front of your eyes. You can see how they interpreted the sky in that way. And they were way ahead of their time because see in the top illustration, the moon in the belly, they had the crescent moon um, when it started off as male and then it got fatter and fatter until half moon when it became female. And then essentially it gave birth to itself on the full moon. And then after that, it returned to being male and then the moon recreates itself. And then the, the idea of the lunar phases, this is one of my favorite legends. And that's, there was a hunter who went out and he, he got an animal in order to feed his family. And then they used the skin to cover themselves at night in order to sleep. So the man put the skin over him as he was sleeping, but then his wife gradually and slowly takes the coat away from, from the man until he is fully exposed. And then he takes the, 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 the skin back and covers himself until it's time to go out. His family's hungry and he has to do it all over again. So it was quite, fa quite fascinating what they have. And um, so one of the things I did at the end of the four and a half years is I put everything into a book and it's a, it's a visual guide. It's mainly to help a, a lot of the guides that come here to learn more about the night sky. Um, and also this includes the Basara sky lore, which is lacking in a lot of the sky lore that we have today. So it's now just re recently out by Penguin Random House by uh, Stroik Nature um, is their imprint, imprint. And so there's a lot more tales of it in there. But this was, in a way, my gift to the, the Botswana people for having me, having me stay. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just really happy in this, that I had this opportunity and continue to have the opportunity. But I have to tell you one last story about the Basara people with the, when we were, I was out there with them. And then suddenly a satellite went across the sky. This is the ISS going into the Earth's shadow. And I thought this was perfect to find out. So I told my translator, I said, you know, ask them what that is. What is that thing moving in the sky? Because in ancient times, they didn't have satellites. And so as they do naturally, they get together and their discussions. Now, the, the interesting thing is they have the click language. So they talk to one another and it's like, <laughs> you don't, it, it's, they have like five different clicks that they use and they have discussions and they, they filter and they, and they move things in the sand. And so then the interpreter told me, well, they said that it was created by the black people. And then they go in and they're talking 
all the clicks. And then they said, I said, well, where, where, where were these people that created this? And they said, and they did their clicking and they said down south, they were down south. And I said, okay. And then they did some more clicking and I said, well, do, do they know what it is? And then my interpreter said, it's a satellite. So they, <laughs> so <laughs> they had a good one on me on that one. <laughs> Anyway, so wonderful people. But I think my favorite thing was one night we were at the campfire um, and this wasn't too long ago and we had an opportunity. It was a wonderfully clear night and we're looking up at the sky. And I just said to one, what do you see? What is it that you see when you first look up at the sky? I mean, what does it mean to you? So the interpreter talked to them and then the answer was peace really beautiful thing and, and and it really encapsulates the feeling of the Botswana people uh, really it's very peaceful now talk about antipodes and i i don't know it's amazing when i was in hawaii i had the opportunity to see um a bolide and it was magnitude minus 20. it just lit up the night sky i was going to go out comet hunting and it must have been early in the morning, like four in the morning. And this thing just came over the sky and it exploded directly overhead and the fragments came down. Um, no one was able to collect the pieces because it fell over the lava field. So you're looking for a black stone amongst black lava in the Volcano National Park. And so <laughs> the rest of the fragments probably fell in the ocean, but it was pretty incredible. But now we fast forward to 2018. Now, Deborah and I were out at a uh, camp, and unfortunately, I became really, really ill. And so I didn't go out on the game drive, and I was in our, our um, safari tent, just very sick. And I didn't know at the time, Dan Green, the Mike Redenko, trying to tell me that this uh, uh, Catalina survey had discovered this new asteroid seven hours before it hit. And you can see the path and it's heading directly toward Botswana. Mm. And it was only the second time in history that an asteroid was detected before its fall. And this one was uh, seven hours before then. So I was in the tent, Deborah was trying to nurse me. And then suddenly the tent just lit up and she just thought someone, uh, they were coming back from a night drive and they had the spotlights on the on the tent and the camp manager though came running in and he was trying to tell me something just fantastic happened and steve you have to get out there you have to look and i was like go away i'm not interested <laughs> i was really sick unfortunately but look at this watch what happens this was taken from south africa near the border of botswana and this is the this is the asteroid coming in and then hits Whoa. i know so right after so right after we got back, like the next day, I went out and I helped the American Media um, Society collect uh, information. I went out in Botswana, although these are from South Africa. I went up through Botswana and I interviewed people who had seen the fall and to help them triangulate where the, the meteorite might have fallen. And this brought me us to one camp, um, Dinaka. And it was in the Kalahari Desert. And I met with a guide who actually saw the terminal blast. He saw the thing come in, he saw the fragments fall, the meteor just vanished from the sky. And uh, this is the location of the artist's impression of the, of the um, incoming asteroid. And the camp manager, in fact, was in a shower and he thought there was a gas explosion. The sonic booms were so intense that it was rattling the, the, um, the structures and they came out to see what was going on. But anyway, in the end, this, now this is an amazing feat. Uh, Peter Jeniskins from the SETI Institute and together with uh, local, um, and, uh, uh, local uh, scientists and others, went out and they actually recovered pieces in the Kalahari Desert. They set out a, a whole line of people and just walked 
amongst the lions. <laughs> and, and, and the first one was cited by a local woman, again, the sun with their incredible eyesight. And it was just this little teeny fragment underneath a bush. How they found it, I have no idea. But it turns out now that this fragment uh, called the Motepi Pan meteorite, uh, they found several pieces, but it turns out that it's probably a piece of Vesta. Mm -hmm. So, and that just happened here in, in 2018. Pretty amazing. Um, and it's fortunate. Now to go from the from the, a bang to a whimper, the skies are so dark here that we have something that we also called a ghost meteor. And here's an arrow. You can see that faint, faint streak coming from the upper left down to lower right. And they sort of look like a comet that's coming in the sky, but it's very dim. It's about fourth magnitude and there's no central streak. It just comes in and it filters through as if it's um, Alka-Seltzer fizz fizzing away. They're, they're pretty amazing. Um, and that, now to show you, if to go to um, a true, we have dark skies here. I can see the zodiacal light from our backyard, but to get to even truer, darker skies, we go to a place called Magadi Gadi Pans National Park. You see that near the center mm -hmm. of, the, of the map in the green, that big long word, Magadi Gadi Pans. And it's a 12,000 square kilometer salt pan, and you get 360 degree flat views in this desert-like region. Um, and we go out there, and just, just and I show you that um, it's a very lonely place and isolated and you're under the sky. We build campfires. We have the, the vehicles that take you out there. Now look at this. We sleep out under the stars and on bedrolls. This is Deborah sleeping. Now this is not a, a composite. This is an actual, just a simple 50 millimeter lens shot. Um, again, probably 60 seconds on an ioptron mount um, and just shows you what the Ada Carina region, that's the coal sack up above, um, stars right down to the horizon. And you have this for 360 degrees. Wow. And the, the, the pans are so flat. We had a, an eclipse recently. It wasn't a total eclipse. It, this was we got a partial, but Madagascar had the had an annular eclipse. But we went, we took people out to the uh, pans, and we were able to see the um, the whole event. It starts off with a green flash coming up above the the flat horizon, and then the serrated moon and sun, and it's just phenomenal. We had partial lunar eclipses. You know, the pans are always fun. So you, <laughs> Deborah's yoga instructor, so I made this composite image of the <laughs> eclipse with the them doing yoga. Um, and we've had beautiful full lunar eclipses as a composite because we live in such a special place that we have baobab trees that some are thousands of years old. Um, uh, beautiful full full eclipses that you know we see. I know you guys get them too. I, I remember in the Northern Hemisphere, <laughs> but there's some that we see. Now look at this one. This was supposed to be the invisible eclipse. Uh, I know you had it too in June of 2020. It was a penumbral eclipse that was only uh, less than 40%. But do look at the two places where I have compare and you see the top image and compare it. Look on the right-hand side in the lunar highlands. You see how it's slightly darker ever so slightly. Yeah, it was just an amazing. You could just, you could just uh, detect this with, it, with the naked eye. It's really incredible eclipse. And we've had two transits of Mercury since I've been here, um, 2016 and 2019. We had the beautiful Venus and Pleiades conjunction, um, which you know, we, all, we all had. Ours was upside down for you guys. And one thing, and I don't know if you had it, we had the lunar eclipse with the, with the blood red Mars, at Mars at opposition in, in, in July 2018, but this was really special. They, on the right, you see the constellation Grus, what the bright star near the horizon is um, Fomalhaut. Um, but you know, we had the moon and Mars up so high in the sky. Uh, it was just a, a fant fantastic sight. And speaking of, Mars, the last apparition, um, 
during his 2020 opposition. These, these images I took were just made with, because um, Mars was essentially really high, it got up to about 70 degrees. And here you see the Milky Way again from the pans and you have the Milky Way upside down. You see the hub of the Milky Way is, is below. That bright star near the bottom is Antares and the rest looking up is going south. But these images of Mars I took with uh, a three inch refractor um, and they just, no CCD or anything. I'm just taking a 50 millimeter lens and a 35 millimeter camera, holding it up to the eyepiece and snapping. And then there are probably composites of like two images, each of these. But, you know, it just reminds me of the, uh, the olden days, the photography. It kind of really resembles what we see through a telescope more than what we see through a CCD, which we'll never see through a telescope. <laughs> but this is, you know, it's only because Mars is, was so high in the sky and so steady that was able to get these results. And if you can even see, I'm, I'm pushing it to like um, up to 400, a three inch refractor up to 400 power and still with no, you know, but, but that's probably the limit, but you can exceed what you would naturally think you can accomplish uh, with, with a small telescope. And then recently, I also published a book on Mars for those that are interested in from reaction books in the UK. Um, it, it, it talks about from early, from the beginnings to up to the, 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 recent, um, the recent explorations of Mars. So if you're interested, but anyway, that's part of what I'm doing. I'm still writing, um, we have, we had the great conjunction. In fact, we had the, on the night before this one, we had the actual conjunction, which was at closest approach, but we had uh, more clouds than is, sh is shown here. And I was only able to see, I could see Jupiter and Saturn through binoculars, but I couldn't see them with the, the naked eye through the clouds, it's just Jupiter. But it was beautiful. That's through the three inch again, what it appeared like from here. Um, and then we've had a whole series of comets. I know we all shared Neowise, but I wanted to show you probably what Neowise looked like also before it became famous. Um, we had several comets that started off very low in the south. Here you see Comet Vertinen, which made a close approach to Earth in 2018, 2019. But in, in December, 2018, it came within 12,000 kilometers of the Earth, and it started off low in Fornax and Arundanus. Oops, sorry, but here it is in Arundanus, over the pants. Very beautiful, very large uh, uh, comet with a diffuse head, and here it was passing the Pleiades, and this was under the full moon. Um, so, but anyway, I think I said thousand, but anyway, twelve million kilometers. <laughs> I said thousand. Mm -hmm. um, and even in this short exposure, you can see the, the comet trailed a little bit um, during its, its, its passage. And then immediately, not long after that, we had Comet Swan, which is a beautiful, beautiful uh, comet that, that put on quite a show for us in the Southern Hemisphere. This is from a sky. Deborah took this photo uh, with, an, with a, like an 18 millimeter lens. And it shows the comet uh, around six magnitude near the zodiacal light. And then it, its tail just grew. It, it moved very rapidly. Its tail grew and it was almost 10 degrees long. But the reason I say it was curious is that it really was more a photographic spectacle than it was a visual spectacle. But still, you know, through binoculars, you could probably see a few degrees of tail, but I know some people, especially in Namibia, they were getting up to 20 degrees of tail. So it was really a spectacular and um, bizarre comet that, but the, the head was visible, but just barely, you know, you know, fifth, it got up to about magnitude 5.5, but from our dark skies, it was still quite a spectacular view. And then these shots in the twilight as it started to approach the sun, and the dust tail started to grow and we were hoping that it was gonna turn around the sun 
and we was even making magnitude estimates of it while using SOHO data. Um, but then it, it fizzled, like many of these comets do. Uh, um, and then right after that, we had Comet Lemon. And it made several passes by some Messier objects in NGC clusters. It was another beautiful binocular comet that reached sixth magnitude, again with a thin um, ion uh, tail. And here was Comet Lemon as it was fading on the left. This is what Neowise looked like from the southern hemisphere. See that little dot? So that's just with a that's with a 200 millimeter lens, even taking a uh, probably a minute exposure. So it, it initially Neowise didn't even live up to expectation uh, surpassing Comet Lemon and was hanging more or less around seventh magnitude at times eighth magnitude. But then who knew? You know, it had the, the pre perihelion flare. So there it was on the left and here it was. This is, you guys had the best view of it without question. Um, it it Neowise entered the, the far northern sky. And for us, we can still see pretty high north, but um, this was in the, in the twilight. We were at least able to see it, but then it grew. It came out from the twilight and it had a beautiful green head with a red tail, sort of what you would see in the ancient times where you would have a, like a, a scimitar, a bloody scimitar of a tail. Um, and then it just gave us some beautiful opportunities. It never got really high in the sky. It was always very low, but it did enter the dark sky. But this is past the time when you already had the most fantastic views. But still, by historical standards, we still, it wasn't a great comet. Um, it was a great photographic comet, but it just didn't have that, uh, the, the real visual punch of like a hell bop or Yakutaki or Comet West or, um, others that I've seen throughout the last 50 years. <laughs> uh, but it was still a beautiful comet. And here, here it was, Comet Neowise uh, joined another one that we had, T2 Pan Stars and um, Comet Lemon. So you can get all three in a, in a 200 millimeter frame as they were passing, going away. And one of my, I, I like the shot anyway, just because it shows the comet entering the zodiacal light. And of course the zodiacal light itself is left over debris from the solar system, including comet tail material. So it's just sort of illustrating a comet depositing material into the, what will, will enhance the zodiacal light in time. And of course we had the super fall and rise of Betelgeuse. And from the Northern Hemisphere, from the Southern Hemisphere, it looked like that. <laughs> Upside down. We also had novae, several novae, um, including 6.5 magnitude novae in 2018, which is in a way unfortunate because one of the things I've been doing here um, is memorizing the Milky Way down to uh, about ninth magnitude using binoculars. So I make many constellations in the hope of discovering a nova. Um, this, this particular nova I wouldn't have discovered for two reasons because First of all, I was in the Northern Hemisphere when it occurred. And second of all, I was in the morning sky and I, I think I'm, I'm not getting up in the morning to look for the Novi. I'm being lazy. I just enjoy this. This is a great opportunity for people. If you, if you ever want to relax and just, it's, it's visual meditation in a way, because you just go out, it's just you and the stars, you make up all these little mini constellations, you create your own names for them. If an over appears suddenly, it's okay, but otherwise it's just, it's like looking up at a bunch of friends each night. It's just a fun way to, to spend the time under the stars. Then we had Nova Reticuli, which was really blew me away because it was well out of the Milky Way in reticulum near the large Magellanic cloud in Doradus and it reached fifth magnitude, which was, and if you, ever heard of reticulum? Say, so why does that sound familiar? And that's probably because of the Zeta Reticuli incident. <laughs> so this one kind of had a, was kind of a hoot to see. Um, but it was beautiful just in the sense of it was, you could see it naked eye at fifth magnitude. Um, and when it began to fade, it really became sort of a, a, a crimson red. 
it, it was fascinating to see. Um, and more recently, you had the, the Nova and Cassiopeia. Now get this, this is just amazing, okay? Now we can get, like I said, up to the northern sky. We can see the Big Dipper, it's at the horizon. We can see Cassiopeia at the horizon. So this one, I just went out and took a guess at where to point the camera while well, I knew where Cassiopeia would be. But I just took this shot. It, it's, it's, um, it's like a 15 second exposure, seven minutes into nautical twilight and the Nova was four degrees above the horizon. <laughs> no, <laughs> at first, I didn't even see this visually. I just took the shot. Then, then I saw these stars and I matched them to an AABSO star chart. And then you can see that little star at the very bottom in between the leaves of the tree is the Nova Cassiopeia, which we had here. I went out a couple uh, nights later and I was able to see it visually with binoculars. Um, like two degrees higher, but still, I thought that was kind of a cute catch. So now we talk about, I think what TSP people are all about, and it's the dark skies and deep sky objects and what you can see. And, you know, we have, really do have uh, what's considered Bordel class one skies, where you can see the zodiacal light, the zodiacal band and gegenschein, M33 naked eye, Milky Way cast shadows, which we've done at TSP. Um, and uh, the, our, but I do laugh at the last one, Jupiter and Venus degrades dark adaptation. I think that's kind of a hoot, but I'll show you something that, that can bring that to light. However, so we do have the zodiacal light. Here's an image. In fact, this is from Didaka where it shows these uh, zodiacal light and band and how it grows in intensity as the sun even nears the horizon. So, um, and here's the zodiacal band with the Milky Way overhead with all the planets in the moon, Venus, Mercury, Moon, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn. That was a couple of years back that we had that. And then here's a shot taken from the pants. And as you can see, the Gegenschein is that oval glow above the word Gegenschein um, with the upside down Milky Way setting into the horizon with the Pleiades off to the, to the right. Now, it's, what's really fascinating, again, and it, it, this has been said before, but I always, even when I lived in Hawaii, I always found it interesting that when people saw the Hawaiian skies, they always said, I've seen darker. Now, this is like from the top of Mauna Kea. <laughs> it's like, you may have seen darker, <laughs> but you haven't seen <laughs> truly dark skies because truly dark skies are so infiltrated with cosmic dust and zodiacal light and everything else that they're actually bright skies. So it, it really is an oxymoron, but you know, truly dark skies are in a way, truly bright skies. And this shows you a short exposure showing the Milky Way hub setting upside down with the large magic Atlantic cloud and the small cloud. Uh, um, and it's showing the ground illuminated by the Milky Way, the light of the Milky Way. Now here was um, Mars when it was in opposition in 2018 during the Sky and Telescope star, Botswana stargazing safari. Uh, on this one, we took them out to the pans and we set up, we had all these tents set up so everyone can enjoy the, the sky. And one of the things we did, we had Mars rising at its brightest in the east, Venus was setting in the west and the Milky Way was about um, nearly very, it was high, uh, still getting high overhead in the south. And so we took this photo, Peter Tyson, we, we set up a little experiment. So here you can see on this film canister, you can see the um, eyepiece canister, it, the shadow of Venus, the shadow of Mars, and just coming toward us, the shadow of the Milky Way. In just wow. one, in one shot, yeah, and you can see M33 naked eye. It's really not an issue, but one of the things we do have in the southern hemisphere that is really glorious uh, are the globular star clusters. They really are the brightest and the best are in in the southern hemisphere. Um, Omega Centauri 47 Tucani and the ones in Aram Pavo, just fantastic. This one it. it the 362 in Tucana. 
2808 in Carina. It's just some, just a multitude. There are beautiful globular clusters in Muska and oh, just so much. But one of the things, and this goes back to the San people, the Basawa, where really what's fascinating is the dark nebulae that you can appreciate. And I, I get lost in it. So this was a shot in the Milky Way overhead in Sagittarius. That's the dark horse, which, you know, we, I remember Barbara Wilson showing me that for the first time from Texas at the Texas Star Party. Um, so I'll, I'll always re remember that. Um, uh, but here, you know, it was directly overhead. And this is, uh, again, this is just a simple one 50 millimeter shot, uh, not, not stacked or anything. It's just, again, probably 30 to 60, probably 60 second exposure again. Um, showing the Milky Way overhead, but the dark nebulae, it, it's, it's incredible. This is two, two images, two 50 millimeter lens images stitched, stitched together from the pans, showing the Eta Carina Nebula to the right, the coal sack in the middle, Alpha and Beta Centauri to the left. This is one of the most remarkable areas of the Milky Way. It, it's unprecedented in its splendor. And this just shows you the Southern Cross and, and Eta Carina. This is just, again, I'm, I'm using a, uh, you know, the diffusing filter here. But again, it, these are just uh, minute exposures. And just, Look at all the objects from bright nebula to planetary nebula to open clusters, jewel box, little jewel box, Eta Carina itself, the Southern Pleiades, just it, it, this whole swath. And most of this, most of everything that you see in here, you can just see either with your naked eye or binoculars. Um, they're really incredible. Now, this is a photograph I took of the Eta Carina nebula. This one is probably like two or three images stacked together. Um, probably with a 200 millimeter lens, but just shows you what you can do. And uh, I was even out looking yesterday at the Keyhole Nebula through a three inch refractor. It's, 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 it's beautiful. And the homunculus, um, we, ha we have an eight inch reflector now. I'm gonna try to see that. I, I was out looking at the other night, the seeing was poor and I thought it could split it. I've seen it before. It, in New Zealand with a nine inch refractor, clearly. And of course I've seen it um, down the winter star party uh, through 36 inch, uh, you know, so on and so <laughs> forth. But these are just things that uh, we can see. And of course the Magellanic clouds uh, are just, well, to put it bluntly, heavenly. Um, they really are naked eye objects. You can see the tarantula nebula naked eye and 47 Ducani is brilliant. In fact, it's that bright star you see to the right of the small Magellanic cloud. These are just some, looking at them, of course, is you're looking into another island universe, one being torn apart by the Milky Way. And we have all these weird and wonderful objects in another galaxy that you can see clearly. Um, and then, the large Magellanic cloud, this is taken from our backyard. That bright spot is the tarantula nebula in it. You can see all the structure in binoculars. It's, mm -hmm. it's fascinating. And this is uh, probably a, a 200 millimeter shot showing the uh, how splintered the galaxy is and just some of the beautiful nebulae and clusters that are involved in it that you can enjoy through your through your telescope. It, it really is a different universe down here. So I, I, I'm encouraging you to come and visit. Um, you can, when up in our northeast corner is Victoria Falls. It's a common uh, jot. If you come to Botswana, just go over the border to Zimbabwe and enjoy the, enjoy the falls. And if you want to learn more about Botswana. I don't know if you've ever seen this the movie out. It's really well done, uh, BBC, I believe, but it's called A United Kingdom. And it really gets to, to the heart of what the Botswana people are like. It's about the first uh, um, president of Botswana, democratically elected, um, who is a black man who married a white woman from England. And that kind of embraces the the 
attitude of the culture. Again, there is no apartheid here in Botswana, it never was. And is it safe to travel to Botswana? Absolutely. Uh, Global Peace Index, the safest place in Africa to visit in 2021 is Botswana. And it's the 30th safest country in the world and its Global Peace Index score makes it safer than the UK or Spain. And I'm here to tell you that where we are in Maun, especially, it's safer, much safer than even the United States. I, it, I cannot tell how beautiful the people are, how friendly they are, and how peaceful they are. Um, so it just it just adds to your your visit without having to worry about anything. Uh, so we hope to see you soon. <laughs> Until we meet again, thank you for your time. That was wonderful, Stephen. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you know, like I said, I've, I've heard you speak before, and every time that uh, I get the opportunity to do so, I'm ready to just jump in and do whatever <laughs> <that> you've been <laughs> doing. Uh, you know, your enthusiasm well, good, for jump astronomy. On, jump on plane because <laughs> absolutely, I was going to say your enthusiasm for for astronomy is certainly infectious, and it's uh, you know obviously inspired a lot of us as well. So uh, I really thank you for this presentation. And uh, I was hoping you might have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, you know, I, I've always wanted to ask yeah. you a few things directly and uh, uh, was really curious about your answers. Uh, you kind of hit this um, as well earlier, but, uh, you know, I think it was Larry Mitchell who told me that you said there's nothing really special about your eyesight, that you're a, I think yeah. the term was visual athlete. Is, is that what it was? Yes. 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 So, you know, for, You've lived a, a life in astronomy that many of us dream of, and, and you have this reputation as such a great visual observer, which you are. But for the average person who's, you know, maybe just getting started in astronomy or has maybe been at it for a while and says, you know, I can't do the things that Stephen does. Uh, what are some tips that you would give them to, to really kind of become better visual athletes, like you said? Yeah. Well, with with any athlete, it's really training. It's difficult today. It's, it's hard. You know, I, I also always call myself a 19th century astronomer now living in the 21st century. <laughs> I think that's more aptly put. Visual athlete is great. Now that was given, that name was given to me by a member of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston ages ago. Ah. Um, his name was Sal Lariccia. And after I gave a presentation, he, he just came up and said, Steve, you, you, I got it. I've got it. You're a visual athlete. You know, in other <laughs> words, it, take, it, it takes training. You, you just think about any sport that you do. You just don't suddenly, well, maybe some people do, you know, <laughs> you know have a golf swing that, that, that miraculously gives you a hole in one every time. I don't know. <laughs> but generally it takes practice. And I think, Today, I say not, I'm a 19th century astronomer because, well, I am. Um, I, I guess I've never been one to rush, to rush an observation. It's always spending a lot of time behind the eyepiece with a given object. And I know in today's world, that's a difficult, very difficult concept. Um, and so, but, that, but that's what it takes. That, that really is what it takes. And I can honestly tell you that going through the log books at, at Harvard Observatory, um, when I started using the nine inch telescope, I, I remember, I think the faintest stars that I could initially see were something on the order of maybe like 11.6. And I was all excited about that. But then as I went through the log books, you just, the magnitude got fainter and fainter and fainter. Wow. I mean, I remember seeing a 16th magnitude star with the nine inch before I, I, I left there, you know, for Hawaii and um, finding variable stars around 13th and 14th magnitude visually. You know, mm -hmm. but this, this is just because I spent so much time behind the eyepiece. And I know, I see, there, there is no right or wrong. And I, I, I really, I can only tell you what I do, uh, mm. what and what I've always done. Now, in the in the old days, not everyone had this has the opportunity that I did, um, and that was initially I was using the fifteen inch refractor, and that was built by um, the original director and his son, William Crunch Bond, and George Philip Bond, 
So this 15 inch refractor, that's 26 feet long, wooden mahogany tube. And they created this plush velvet observing chair that goes around on a railroad track. And you just sit in the chair, this room enough for two people, but you just sit in this chair with this huge telescope and there's like a little plate on this iron wheel that you turn to right, raise and lower yourself. And that's it, you sit in this position and then let's say I'm observing Saturn, you know, and that's all you did for the night was you sat in that position and just monitored Saturn. Every time you go out, don't expect to see what I see. You, you go out and it, you see what you see, then go out the next night your, your mind will automatically remember what you saw the night before. Mm -hmm. You'll see it much sooner the next time you go out, and then you'll add a little more detail because now you're spending more time. Then you go out the next night. What you saw in the first night goes bang. I, I can see the bands on Jupiter. Um, I saw a little festoon. What else can I see? So your mind, you're constantly searching. It's really an investigation. Okay, so it's even like the other night, I, I was out looking at the moon and this one thing I do is I, is I, I don't want to know what's been seen. I don't, I want to discover myself what's on the moon. And it, it, there's just so much, there's just so much to see um, that you, 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 I just wait for something to, to snap out at me and then you look at it and then you study it in, in detail. I, I honestly, all, none of my discoveries were intentional. Like I didn't say tonight, I, 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 I'm gonna go out and find a comet. I'm gonna sweep in this area of the sky and I'm looking for a comet, you know? It's, it's like when I found the spokes, it was not, I'm going to go out and I'm going to discover <laughs> something on Saturn. You know? It's just like, it's, it's just looking, relaxing, breathing. Oh, do you? There's no rush. I mean, especially for the for the young. So it's an interesting thing that you said there, Stephen. Yeah, because uh, you know, talking to Larry Mitchell, he mentioned the same thing. He said, you know, looking at Stephen, uh, you you guys spend a lot of time out and uh, under dark skies together. And he yes. said, oftentimes Stephen would uh, just focus on one object the entire night. And yeah. you would have, I guess it was a black cloth or something that- Oh yeah, put something cover. over. Yeah, yeah. To, to cover and, and uh, you would just, and it could be something even, you know, fairly bright and, and, and you know, obviously not something that is so um, obscure that, uh, you know, most people wouldn't even bother to go to it. He said, you know, oftentimes you would be doing that with Messier objects and you would spend an entire evening just studying it and waiting for the sky conditions to change to see what else you discovered. So I, I always thought that was fascinating. And, and by the way, he gave very similar advice to what you gave as well. You know, don't rush it, take, take your time and, uh, you know, spend the time to, to see what it is that you can see and, and, and what presents itself after yeah. some time as well. So I uh, really appreciate that. And that's, I can, and that's true. And what Larry said too is um, very important. Atmospheric conditions change. What you see in one night doesn't mean that you're going to, you're, you, that's it. That's all you can see. It really is what you can see over um, many, many nights. And again, just repeat observations. Repeat, Nothing different than, okay, seeing faint, boy, you know, seeing Halley's Comet. Um, you know, I've given this talk so many times, but I, I, I know, but I, it's an important point. It's like when I, when I first, again, I didn't go out intending to see Halley's Comet. The whole project was to see how faint I could see. <laughs> So that when the first person says <laughs> that they saw Halley's Comet, let's say through an eight inch telescope at sea level at this particular magnitude, the idea was for me to be at 14,000 feet using a 24 inch um, uh, Cassegrain reflected that was, had mirrored by Texero that was just polished. I'm at 14,000 feet with, um, you know, with bottled oxygen, looking at the zenith, 
<laughs> you know, in this field. How fake right. can you be in this field? And so the, the, the whole irony of the story is I, I, well, I've got this. Okay. I have to re almost repeat the lecture. I don't have to, but anyway. <laughs> You know, I had, I had a, someone gave me what's called a photostat. It wasn't even a photocopy. It was called a photostat uh -huh. of the Palomar Sky Survey <laughs> that I was using uh, and to see. But, and I was recording stars that I thought were fainter than the Palomar Sky Survey. Okay? Wow. But I did not see, okay, I did not see the comet. And when I brought them, because now next to me in the 88-inch telescope, they had a CCD camera. And they were following the comet. So I came back after spending an hour, eyes were bloodshot, saying, All right, I, I've spent so much time looking in the field, and this is how faint I could see. I couldn't see the comet, I told them, but I said, Geez, you know, I, the comet must be really faint because I think I'm seeing fainter than the stars in the <laughs> Palomar Sky Survey. And then he said, They had a Palomar Sky Survey chart there. They looked at them and compared them and said, Oh, I'm sorry, Steve, but this photostat only goes down to like 16th magnitude, not 21st. <laughs> but I can tell you the stars that you charted are on the Palomar Sky Survey near the limit. <laughs> 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 and they said, but I have to, I have to, here's, here's the thing, okay? So, but understand, the first thing I said was, I did not see the comet. That's the important thing. Right. They're the ones who said, Steve, you just saw down to the limit of the Palomar Sky Survey. The problem <laughs> is you're looking in the wrong field. You know, oh. I had tested, I had tested, like at the time I was living in Boston and I had taken the UT time for Boston and applied it in Hawaii. That's what altitude does to you. So I didn't compensate, <laughs> oh. I didn't compensate for the six hour difference in the movement. So I was looking in the wrong field. But the point is that even in the wrong field, I was blindly charting stars down to the limit of the of Palomar. And then, of course, the second time I went out, I did see, I did see it. Um, but the important thing here was, it's the photon hits. You know, like when you're seeing faint, it's you 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 collect photons. It's like bang. It, the first time you see something, it's did I see it? Right. And then, bang, you get another mm -hmm. hit and you go, I think that was right. And then more photon hits, the more times you keep getting a repeat hit, then you build your confidence level enough mm -hmm. to say, that's it, that this, this is real. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm seeing. Like someone, someone once said, it was a thread, it, someone said, Steve O'Mara, why is it Steve O'Mara never says he's 65% confident he saw something? Why is he always 100% sure? <laughs> it's a valid point, but the, uh, just for me, uh, why, what's the purpose of saying, I think I saw something? And to me, I either right. see it or I, or I don't. If I get a 65 percent tile, if I'm like I'm 65 percent confident I saw it, I sit down and say, I didn't see it. I have to try another night. And I'll keep trying till they either say, I can't see it mm -hmm. or I see it. <laughs> there's, there's only in my book, there's only one way or the other. If you're 90 percent confident of seeing something, you're not still 100%. You need to go back out and observe again until you're 100%. Up until that point, it's a no-go. You know, it's, it doesn't mean anything. So that's kind of why. I if, I, if I can uh, shamelessly plug one of your books, Stephen, um, yeah. honestly, the, the first uh, observing book I uh, ever read when I first started in astronomy was your book on the Messier objects. Okay. And... Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm honestly here to tell you, I think that reading that book and especially the, the first part of the book, you, uh, you explain an awful lot of what you just, uh, not with, with, not with the same enthusiasm that you just did, but how to observe. <laughs> okay. It's, it's hard yeah. to capture your enthusiasm in, in, in words that we just saw. Yeah. 
and I would strongly recommend, and I'm, and I hope there's a lot of younger folks uh, watching this uh, 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 this program. I highly recommend that they get that book. And uh, to, if if nothing else, oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> if nothing else, <laughs> just for the uh, for the first part of that book, which is a phenomenal uh, guide to how to observe. And uh, I, I really thank you for that. I I I, I think it I think it helped me pull myself into astronomy and in a lifelong passion. So thank you. Oh, good. Welcome. Yeah, I yeah, still take I, that book out with me to the Texas Star Party yeah. and other star parties as well, even though it was one of the first books I had. And, and most recently, this one. Oh, the Herschel 400. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. I, there was someone else who wrote to me and said, I'm really disappointed, Steve, <laughs> that the Herschel, I said, I love the Herschel 400 book, but I, I have to say, I'm disappointed that it's not in the same format as the Messier book. But I said, well, <laughs> if it was, <laughs> if it was be... <laughs> you, you, can, you can use it at Gold's Gym to do you know, <laughs> bench presses with it. <laughs> I mean, visual at so, in, yeah. in one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I have a question for you, man. Uh, okay. you, you've written millions of articles and all kinds of cool stuff. And, you know, a lot of the Sky and Telescope stuff we've all read uh, multiple yeah, times. But, you know, I know you've been to multiple TSPs and, you know, TSP, like you said, is, a, is, is something that brings you a lot of joy. And I wonder, uh, you know, maybe what's, what's one, you know, really standout moment for you uh that you have from tsp that still to this day just sticks with you uh and kind of so many fires you <laughs> oh no there's there's so many oh my god where do i begin <laughs> oh i know where to begin begin at the beginning all right first time this is just a funny story okay but it's of course it sticks with me all right so i was coming down i was working at sky and telescope at the time um and i came down to Talk to TSP. It must have been after I found Halley's Comet, so mid '80s, and so here I am representing SMT, and I had I had a suit coat, I had a shirt and tie, I got all <laughs> dressed up, <laughs> and I get up there, and um, they're introducing me, and I'm, I, I I start to talk, and then suddenly two women start walking up the aisle and then i'm talking and i'm watching where are they going and the next thing you know they're undressing me and they're taking off my, <laughs> my coat jacket <laughs> one's undoing my tie they start undoing my buttons <laughs> i think it was larry and barbara get up and said welcome to tsp no ties allowed <laughs> That's you know, awesome. So, like when you said, you know, we have a T-shirt waiting for you. Kind of like, okay, I get the picture. I get the picture. <laughs> Putting clothes on you now, as opposed to the other. Right. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. I mean that, but that kind of. Oh, you know what though? It's just. I mean, of course, we do so many beautiful and wonderful observations at TSP. I mean, I. I mean, okay, all right. A memory that sticks out was when Clyde Townbout came, mm -hmm. and um, Larry and Barbara and, and the Goldbergs, and um, I think Brent Arkinall was there as the guest speaker, and David Levy, and and we, I came down with, which we all all did at the TSP. We had observing challenges, and there was a, a Harvard astronomer who said, "Steve, we went out to lunch once with uh, Lee Robinson." At, who was the editor of Sky and Telescope then. And he said, Steve, I think, do you think it's possible that you guys can see a, a gravitational lens? You know, and I was like, well, I don't, I don't know. And he told me all about this thing. And he goes, well, I said, look at, I'm going to the Texas Star Party and they have lots of instruments at TSP. And I said, we should, we should try it there. And that was the time Clyde Tombaugh was there. And so we did, we, 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 we got the, we, we were able to see the, the twin quasar in Ursa Major, you know, through Larry's instrument, through Barbara's instrument, through Summerfield instrument, through Ken's instrument, the 18 inch, and um, it was on and on. And then Clyde Tombaugh saw it. And it, it was just, he was, he was ecstatic just to be able to imagine that for someone 
who, oh boy, you know, a farm boy going from just like naked eye astronomy, drawing planets and getting access to, you know, the low observatory and, and then, oh, it, it just, and then for him to see a gravitational lens, you know, just right. putting him in, into another dimension. That was just fascinating. Aside from the fact of his puns, his really horrible puns <laughs> and jokes, he was just, <laughs> he used to tell, like, he used to tell, he had, a, he had dozens of crow jokes and we'd be walking along under the dark Texas skies, you know, with the red flashlights, of course. And then he'd say, where does a crow go to drink? A crowbar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and then he'd sit there and just, he'd just you know, sit there, he'd stand there and just wait for you to laugh. And then like Jupiter was up once and he was walking along and he said, there's Jupiter by Jove. And then nobody said anything and he didn't get, give up. He just kept going. By Jove, nobody said. <laughs> By Jove, we get it, we get it. <laughs> <That was okay. laughs> no, but you know, from from anything from you know, two in the morning corn dogs. The first time I ever had a corn dog. Was like, <laughs> <laughs> and the Frito pies, absolutely. You know, it's interesting you yeah. mentioned that. Stephen. And then you know, uh -huh. and then they had Larry and Barbara and, and Matt, and they had the um, Ain't No catalog. Yes, right. Oh, uh, you know, in the arguments we have on the field, fun arguments, you know, just everyone in Matt Delvarius going around and we used to call them the celestial police. You know, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that that person accurately, you know, it was just such fun. It was such a great camaraderie between everyone on the field and, and you, you know, like going up Larry's, 36 inch whatever and I'm standing up there and holding on trying to hold on to the telescope <laughs> right yeah but they really at Texas Star Party because I was a planetary observer and like I said in, the, in the, my book they really at Texas they all, all you know the Goldbergs and Amelia Goldbergs uh, and, and Barbara among highly acclaimed visual women astronomers visual astronomers and and, and it's just so many people. I mean, but the, they really brought my interest into the deep sky, um, to the deep, deep sky. And, and to tell you the truth, Larry even showed me a deep sky object one time and said, what, how much can you see? I think it was like in the, the Siamese twins galaxies. And they're looking at it for the tidal tales. And I don't remember the first view, but I remember the second time I came to TSP, Larry showed me them again. He says, what do you see? And I said, oh, I see this, I see this, I see the tidal tales. He goes, aha, you didn't see that the first time you were here. Ah. <laughs> so it goes back to what we were saying before, you know, so experience that the first time I look at something, I didn't see the tidal tales, you know? And then the second time I look, I did without even knowing mm -hmm. I had, increased my my deep sky prowess if you want to call it that and um yeah i mean i had, oh and we just did crazy things we did marfa we used to go from tsp down to marfa i don't know if you know this story but uh oh what well because i was interested in bats and so we had bat detectors and we used to love and go out and look for bats which used to live right above the Texas Star Party sign at the gateway. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they, they were also flying around in Marfa and we would drive down to Marfa. And I remember one time, we, it was David Levy and Larry and Peter Jedeke and we were th under a street lamp in Marfa and throwing up pebbles and looking at the bats coming down <laughs> to catch the pebbles. And then this car pulled up like a Cadillac and there were two ladies of the night inside. And they went, rolled down the window and they went, hi, what are you guys up to? And I just said, playing with bats. And then the window rolled up. <laughs> <laughs> it was just classic. And we had fun. So we went out to look at the Marfa lights. And this is the days of the green laser when they first came out. Uh -huh. And then a school bus pulled up. 
and this, this is a terrible story, but a school bus pulled up and we all hid in the bushes. And then all the kids come out of the school bus and they're all like looking for the Marfa lights and wow. And then whoever had the, I forget who it was, who had the green laser, started shining it off into the bushes. All the kids are screaming and they ran back onto the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're one of those kids watching this now, you know. <laughs> Somewhere there's a kid that will never go here or an adult now that will never do anything. No, I swear we saw green lights out there. <laughs> oh my god. That's awesome. No, yeah. Yeah. Well, Stephen, if I could ask you one more question, you've been very yeah. generous with your time today. Um, yeah. You know, you've you've amassed a, a tremendous, you know, just mental catalog of all these things that you've observed. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of what you've spoken about, they're still on my bucket list to observe as well. But uh, do you have a favorite object that uh, no matter what it is or what time of year it is or you know, where you're at, you just love observing that object? Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, I'm, I guess I have to. It, it's old, but I have to say the Orion Nebula. Oh, wow. Or, I mean, it, you know, give, given that it, that time and, and again, but it harks back to the, the time I had at Harvard because they, they devoted an entire annal to the Orion Nebula, mm. you know, so they studied that thing to pieces. It, it, and and I, I just used to love the drawings that they made of it. And, and when I was reading through the journals, everything. So that that has an intimate tie to me. Um, Saturn, of course, is 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 beautiful. Um, but then d deep sky objects, you know, beyond beyond Orion. Um, oh God, so many. Uh, it's like Larry said, it's trying to pick your favorite kid, right? It's <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it really is. Um, I know in the southern. Okay, like I have like little favorites of things, like in the southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. There's, there's the little jewel box. Like everyone talks about the jewel box, but there's another object in Karina. It's just on this tiny little thing, little pipsqueak thing to the naked eye. Binoculars, you could just start to start to just just start to resolve it. Then you put the telescope on, even a small telescope, and it's just it, it just punches you with it, it's, mm. its magnificence. It's it's, it's all piled together the, the the little the jewel box itself is beautiful in itself but it's a little more spread out this one just is magnificent i think it's superior to to the the jewel box and every time i'm out i have to i, I do have to look at that because it excites me to, to see it that tense agglomeration of of stars um i don't know like i said i geez, Every object, I know Larry's right. <laughs> Every object is, is, is so. And I hate asking that question, but. Uh, I know, but yeah, that's okay. But, you know, there's, 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 it is true. But, I'm always um, fascinated by the answers, yes. Yeah, you know, but I, I guess it comes down to the classic things of what you first observed when you were young, for me anyway. Right. Um, I, I, okay, for, for example, I, and again, I know they're trite, but the beehive cluster, See now, because I remember the first time I saw that through binoculars and I was a Boy Scout and someone had these Zoom binoculars. And I don't know, I saw this fuzzy thing when I was a kid up in the sky and this kid handed me, the scout leader handed me the binoculars and pointed it out. And I was blown away when it just shattered into starlight. Um, it re that, really, that really just sticks with me. But I mean, I have my favorite stars for, you know, for, for personal reasons, like, okay, Bart Bach, um, his favorite, because he spent so much time studying it was Ada Carina in the, in the star Ada Carina. He always said, when I die, that's where I'm going to go, the Ada mm. Carina. I mean, I love Ada Carina. I, every time I go out and it's in the sky, I have to look at Ada Carina just because you don't know what it's going to do. It's just, it's just a beautiful object. Um, in the nebula course surrounding it, but even just the star Ada Carina. But yeah, anyway. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I, thank again. You. I, it's, a good, it's a good question, but so many I, objects are so beautiful. 
I, and and I, I had a suspicion you might say that as well because no, everybody that's okay, who's been but in it, astronomy, it is true. yeah, it's, it's one day one you things. know one day someone's going to go absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Well, I think it's a testament to the beauty of the universe above and uh, yeah, you know, all that it has but, to but offer for us. In what you in what you say there is, I, I, to, I'm going to totally be honest because. I've spent now the majority of my life under, okay, admittedly really dark skies yes. from Hawaii now to Botswana. I spend the vast majority of my time, I think, looking at the sky. Mm. Okay. Uh, I, I want to capture what the naked eye can see under a, a dark sky and what we all know is a vanishing universe. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to record, like when I show you the photograph of the Gegenschein, you know, when you can see the Gegenschein, no one knows, mm -hmm. hardly anyone can see the Gegenschein anymore. It's become a myth, you know, but it, it's real. And so I'm trying to just, just, uh, in fact, I have to say the first couple of years, swear to God, two years, the first two years that I lived in Botswana, I did not learn the Southern sky because I wanted to gain that childhood wonder of looking at the sky and not knowing what I'm seeing. I mean, I go to the Northern sky and I'd say, okay, I look up and go, oh, square peg is this, oh, there's a right, oh. Right. <laughs> you, you, you just can't erase that, you know, you, you have a pattern and bang, you, you, this evolutionary control from your reptilian brain takes over. <laughs> but here it's in the Southern sky, it was just magnificent to be able to capture that unknown. Wow. What are these things? What? And then, you know, so then I started to learn more and more about the Southern constellations. I was always a pighead about the Southern constellations saying, ah, then, you know, a bunch of mechanical things that are you know, <laughs> you know, and right. then when you get to learn them, it, when you get to learn them and you get to see them and you get to appreciate them and you get to appreciate when they were created during the age of enlightenment um and what the, it just becomes a whole new world it really is a, a whole new way of exploring but yeah the naked eye sky and those faint ghost meteors and whatever the sky can throw at me as far as um what i can see with the eye not you know not so much how faint can you see you're not just the things that, that are beautiful that you can, that just make you want to look up and on. I, I just want to capture that and somehow keep a record of it so that those were the days, my friend. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Stephen, as I said before, thank you so much for joining us today. This is an absolute yeah. treat. And like I said, every time I've heard you speak, I'm always inspired to, to get out there. And uh, I think I can speak for Will and Don ourselves. We want to get out to Botswana soon and, and certainly take advantage of those beautiful skies that you have. Yeah. But, uh, uh, again, thank you for all that you've done for astronomy, all that you've done for the Texas Star Party, all the wonderful books that you've put out for us. And, and like I said, I, all of us have these in our bookshelves and I uh, look forward to the new books that are coming out. And hopefully we can join you, join you on one of these tours coming up soon. Yeah, too. please so do. Looking forward please do. To that. That'd be so, so much fun. What, what thank are, you. What, what an honor that would be. But thank oh, you so much. The honor would be ours. Thank yes. you, really, because for what TSP has done for me in my own education and growth, I mean, really, it's a, it's a fantastic star party. I wish you well. I wish I could be there. Miss you guys. And take care. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Man, just an epic, epic talk that was. Uh, I don't know, Joe. What do you think? Oh, you're, you're muted, Joe. Haha, -ha, you did it tonight. I did it tonight, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, some people will see athletes like LeBron James or whatnot on the street and, and totally uh, geek out over them. Uh, we did the same thing with Stephen O'Mara. So it was just a, a fascinating conversation with him. And he's so down to earth and, and um, gracious with his time and, and willing to share all of that. So uh, I was really happy uh, that we had that opportunity and, and that we got the chance to share that with everybody else here. And uh, that was only one half of our 
guest speaker list tonight because we also have Dr. Carl Gebhardt, who's going to be joining us in just a little bit of time uh, to share with us some of the initial results that they're getting from the Hobby Eberly Telescope Dark, Dark Energy Experiment. Um, that's called HETDEX. Uh, you'll hear that term a lot tonight. Uh, and what they're doing is um, using that tool to, to measure the expansion rate 10 billion years ago with the goal of discovering the underlying nature of the universe. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be an awesome presentation with Dr. Carl Gebhardt. He's actually backstage. You can't see him now. We see him, but he'll be joining us here shortly. So <laughs> looking forward to that. And I always have this ready for uh, showing some of the data that we get from the uh, board of visitors there at the McDonald Observatory. This is just a subset of some of that data and he'll talk a lot about that, I'm sure. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff they're doing on, on the mountains out there in West Texas, just like a few miles down the road from the Prude Ranch where we have Texas Star Party. And so it's, you know, it's one of those things you can kind of just go out there and, and knock on doors until you find people like Carl to talk to. But no, it's, it's a great thing. To, it's a great place, a great facility, so much to do and see in that area, man, it's just, it's a lot of, it's a lot of good times. And, um, you know, it's Friday night, Joe, and, uh, we have guest speakers on Friday nights and that's always cool. Uh, but one thing we do out at the Prude Ranch on Friday is we all get next to the mess hall or the cafeteria, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and Robert Reeves gets on the roof with a camera. We all assemble and we take a group photo and, um, Don, Joe, and I thought it would be really cool, really nostalgic to take a look back at some of the old uh, Texas Star Party group photos that go back into the 80s. There's a few years that are missing for whatever reason. Uh, but, you know, it might be cool for us to take a little stroll down memory lane. Uh, and I'm in some of these pictures. I know, Joe, you are in some of them, too. Yeah. And it's a cool thing to do, right? It really is. And I'm trying to find the video here, by the way. So this is uh, uh, something I've got to get queued up. But no, it really is. You know, for anybody who's been to the Texas Star Party, um, the photos uh, on Fridays, you said, Will, is that usually when we do them? Yeah, it's usually on Friday. And I mean, it's, a, it, it, you know, I think it's about maybe one or something. It's right after, I think, the lunch on Friday. And uh, it's cool because, you know, for the first couple of years I went to TSP, I kind of missed it. Uh, I, I didn't really understand what was going on. I was like Larry Mitchell. I was there for the skies. I'm, I'm working all, all night, sleeping all day. I don't need to do any of these other activities. Uh, and then over time I was like, man, you know, I really should be in these pictures cause this is pretty cool. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you have to, uh, you have to really get out there and, and, uh, and get it, get in the mix, um, for it. Uh, so we have that as I wonder if Don can maybe help us out with that. I don't know uh, how we ended up missing that one. Yeah, not sure where that is right now. Um, but anyway, we'll look for that one and come back to it. Um, I think we can probably give away some door prizes real quick. Oh, here we go. Oh, there yeah. we go. Okay. Uh, there's no music, Don. I don't think the. Uh... We can narrate over it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so these go back, you know, so far that you know, we've got the black and white photos there, right? There's 1983. Yeah. Much larger crowd for the photo in 83. Yeah, right there at the Prude Ranch on that one. Uh, kind of recognize that area. And what we'll do is we'll also upload this video to uh, various YouTube channels. Houston, probably Astronomical Society will get it on their YouTube. I'll get it on mine and... Uh, you can check this out anytime you want. Try to spot yourself. It's kind of like a Where's Waldo of uh, finding yourself in the in the, the, right. the ESP photos. And there's a lot of people, man, over the years. It really is. They're being creative, coming up with uh, everybody posed in the state of Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. State, of, state of Texas there. Yep. 90s, the, the color photos really started coming about. Uh, you know, that was when uh, <laughs> I, you'd think we were, you know, using daguerreotypes or something like that. <laughs> and here we are in the new millennium. Yeah. 2001. And the interesting thing, Will, like I said, I know the audio is out on this one, but, uh, you know, when you look at these photos, and I know you put this video together. Um, you know, it's amazing to see how many different people there are, but at the same time, how many folks are there throughout the um, kind of that entire span? Yeah, 
And, you know, you can go the whole star party without meeting certain people. They're either on other fields or this or that. Maybe you meet them in the dining hall. You never see them at night. You know, everybody right. appears to their little their little sections of the prude ranch to do the observing. We're all there to do observing. Like Steven said, you know, we're we're there to hunt the faint stuff. So let's get it done. Right. But uh, there is that camaraderie thing that you get when you go to a Texas star party that is invaluable. Really, it's like networking. It's uh it's being there with the people you already know. And every year you meet someone new, you make friends. And then it's like a family reunion after that. It really is. You're going out to the ranch to meet with the with the old family, you know. And um, it's really cool to see over the years how wardrobe has changed as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not known for our fashion sense as uh, amateur astronomers. <laughs> other than these Texas Star Party t-shirts, like I said, fresh off the runways in Milan and Paris. So. <laughs> Yeah. And it years. Yeah. Yeah. We, you can tell we're definitely, uh, we definitely know what we're doing, uh, as far as that goes, but no, it's, it's just a good time. Um, all the way through the years, uh, there's been, you know, just great, great times at Texas star party. Right. And these photos kind of highlight that. And Hey, if you're there and, uh, you're in the picture, you're part of history at that point. Uh, I'm sure somebody has all the years hung up in their office or something. Uh, probably Robert Reeves himself, actually, the guy who takes the photos nowadays. Absolutely. Uh, and um, so it's really cool. And you can order these uh, while you're at the Texas Star Party. I, don't, I think it's like $10 or something or somewhere at $15 to get a, a, a printed out copy, which is pretty cool. So Absolutely. You can them and display them. Yep. This is when we had uh, Pranvera join us. You can see right. the Kosovo flag there up at the front. And she was a fantastic speaker. I mean, just really motivational and inspirational. Yeah, and you can see That's the guys in the back row are very excited to be there, usually. Uh, yes. <laughs> they're the ones who are super stoked to be at Texas Star Party. And uh, 2019 was a fun year. That was the last year we all got to see that each other. That was the last year. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I'm in there somewhere. I think Joe, you might be in there or you, you yeah. as the couple anyway. Yep. Lots of friends we see in here. We see Larry Mitchell in the middle there. Uh, just a ton of cool people to hang out with at the Texas star party. I mean, it's just, it's so much fun. And, um, you know, Friday night again, we're on Friday night. It's the weekend y'all here we are. Uh, we do giveaways at the Texas star party. So I think maybe we should do, the uh, what I guess the second part of tonight's giveaway, or are we already? No, we're actually going to hold off on that right now. Oh, we so, are. Yes, because we have Dr. Carl Gebhardt with us. Oh, and we want to learn about everything that's going on there. So, hey, Carl, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you all doing? We're doing fantastic. Thank you. Really appreciate you joining us tonight, and uh, you know, giving us a, a an overview of all the work that you guys are doing there in West Texas, not too far from where we have the Texas Star Party. So, uh, mm -hmm. really appreciate it, and. Uh, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Dr. Carl Gebhardt, uh, he is the Herman and Jones Suit Professor of Astrophysics at the University of Texas. He grew up in Rochester, New York, so that's a little bit of a ways away from, from West Texas. Uh, but his career has taken him through Michigan State University, Rutgers University, University of Michigan, University of California at Santa Cruz, and eventually to the University of Texas in 2000. He works on a variety of galaxy studies, ranging from black holes to dark matter to dark energy. He leads the Hobby Eberly Telescope Dark Energy Experiment, HETDEX, which uses the HET to make the most accurate measure of the expansion rate of the early universe. And um, I've had the opportunity to listen to you talk before. Your, your, your presentations are absolutely engaging. I think this is going to be a special treat for everybody watching. Uh, Dr. Carl Gebhardt, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I am always excited to talk about the work we're doing now out at McDonald Observatory, and specifically to the Texas Star Party. It is, when I, uh, so just before I came to Texas, everyone, all the astronomers out in California would say, have you been to the Texas Star Party? Have you heard about it? And they were all super excited and it was fantastic. So it's it's, uh, it's great to be here. So great, so I'm gonna tell you about the Hobby Eberly Telescope, a dark energy experiment. I'm gonna start on my board, on my whiteboard, uh, so right here, and just to do some very simple diagrams. And then I'll jump to like a talk where I wanna show you uh, some of the results. So what we're doing out at the observatory is we're trying to understand the expansion of the universe. One of the goals here is to, uh, is to 
it's is to to understand where the Big Bang came from, what gravity is. It is remarkable that we don't understand what gravity is. We know what it does. We know if I take this marker and if I let go, it will fall down. And we can talk about the curvature of space time. You know, we can talk about it in terms of a force, which it isn't really. But we don't understand the nature of why space time is curved. And we are in a big mystery right now in that the universe is expanding in a way that we just don't understand. Um, and some of the solutions to why it is expanding that way is the Big Bang may be wrong. Gravity may not be understood yet, or there's a new type of energy out there. So anyway, so this is what I want to um, uh, talk about. <clears throat> and let me start out with what we're doing at the telescope. So I'm gonna show you a couple of maps later on that I am super excited about. And every time I make these maps, uh, and I just made one, just yesterday, I made a new map of the of the very early universe uh, because we got some new data analysis. <clears throat> and I'm gonna show you that map, and I'm gonna show you the map before the 100 collaborators in my in my uh, uh, collaboration have seen it yet. Um, so what we are doing is we're looking out in the universe. So let's, let's imagine a person here. Let me make sure you can see this, okay. So we're down here, and we're looking out in the universe, and we have a smile on our face because we're looking out in the universe. Okay, and when you go out at night and you look out in the universe, now, I, we're not looking at uh, particular objects. We're taking the light from the individual objects and we're making a map. So we look over a huge uh, angle of the universe, and I'll show you exactly where. We actually are looking all around the Big Dipper. So we look out in the universe out in the wedge, all right? So just imagine you look this way in the universe, and you look this way in the universe. We live in a weird universe that we all understand, and I'm sure many of you understand all these things, but I'm gonna walk you through because there's a few concepts that I just wanna make sure we get, because it's really important. And we all understand that as we, and so say, and so as we look out, maybe we see a galaxy. So there's a galaxy here, there's a, there's a galaxy out here, there's a galaxy out here. As we look out, we see these galaxies. Now we all know about, uh, about look back time. And the universe has done us a favor. And the favor is the speed of light is finite. And why that's a favor to us, it is, we, we would be so hard to do anything if the universe hasn't provided this gift that the speed of light is finite. Because as we know, when we look out, we see that object, that object, and that object. The objects that are farther away because the light had to travel are young. So out here, you have young, and this is early in the universe. These objects over here are old, and this is late. So I'm often going to use the words uh, early for the early time in the universe and late for the late time in the universe. There is an ultimate limit, too. And this is, this is why I, I, I want to make this plot. I want you to follow me along because I'm going to um, show a map that we've made already. There is a boundary that we get to. This is what we call the observable universe. And we cannot see beyond the observable universe as far as we can tell. The observable universe is that length for which you take the age of the universe, multiply by the speed of light, and you are bounded by what you can see. Our universe is only so big, the observable universe is only so big and we can't do anything about it because the speed of light is finite. And so that doesn't mean there's nothing beyond there. We know there's, we, we, we are pretty assured that there is stuff beyond the observable universe. What it, how far it is, we don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's any, the size of the universe, of the whole universe, is somewhere between the observable universe and really, really big. And really, really big is the best scientific term that we can apply. But anyway, so we look out and we go out and what we're doing here, and this is where it gets weird. As you look back in time, let me, uh, I'll back it up. As you look uh, to objects further and further away, you're looking at objects that are younger to younger. Now, what happens though, 
is we know, at least our best theory, which is pretty well understood, is that the universe at some point in the past was small and hot. Every model, every, and we do have multiple models beyond the Big Bang, but every model has the fundamental assumptions that at some point you have to explain that the universe was small and hot. Well, this is weird. Look what I'm doing here. So you have an object, say there's an object on this part of the universe, we look there, and then way over here, there's an object over here. In the past though, the universe was smaller. We started out in the Big Bang with everything in a very, very small spot. The, the, where the size of the observable universe, where our math breaks down in the early universe was the size of a grapefruit. Okay, and so and so that's that's kind of where our math breaks down. We can't really say what what uh, what goes beyond that point. We can't draw that down to a point of zero. In other words, so you have these objects that are at the edge of the that are, that for us are very far away. Okay, but for them, they're right next to each other. So we have this weird construct that as you look out. The objects are actually, they appear to us very far away, because that's the way our universe is right now, because we think we think light travels in a straight line, right? But in fact, the universe is significantly small at that point. When you look at the objects at the edge of the universe, you're really seeing very, very small features. Very, these objects are very close together. So we have two things that, so, so there's multiple things that we can do by, by, by looking at objects and making a whole model, a whole map of where the objects are, two things can happen. Imagine two objects that are close together in the early universe. The universe is expanding out. So now I'm gonna walk this backwards. Two objects are expanding out. And then what happens is because there's a gravitational attraction between these two, if they were close together, in the beginning, they would slowly come together. And so how fast they come together though, is dependent on the size of gravity, on the effect of gravity. And so what goes on is that if we can make this map, and I'll show you the map in a moment because I'm super excited about it. If we can make this map, a few things we can get here. One is we can get how gravity works. That is, we can measure the effect of gravity. We believe we have an understanding that on large scales, it goes as one over the distance squared. This is what we're all taught. It works remarkably well. Okay, so that's one, so that's one thing we're gonna test is, is this the best model for gravity on very large scales? But the other thing that's important is that what we're, if we make this map of galaxies, we can get how the universe expands. And this is the whole point of Hetex, is to make this map of this evolution, again, because we have this gift that the speed of light is finite, we can make this map of how things evolve. So, 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 so that's, the, that's the essence of Hetex, is that is we are after how the galaxies are clustered together early on in the universe. We can compare that at different times. You look at how they're clustered at this time, this time, this time, and this time. And then you can disentangle the effects of gravity, if you have to modify how gravity works, with how much the universe expands. That's what Hetex is. So now let me show you a few things. Let me just share my screen. Uh, share. It shows a couple of buttons here. Make sure. Oops. Oops. Hold on a second. I got the wonders of technology. The wonders I got. <laughs> I want to share. We can get to the origins of the universe, but uh... let's, let's just do the entire screen. So, can you see it now? We're adding it to the stream. Oh, there, there it is. Go. There it is. Okay. So, let me pop this up here, and I want to talk about it for a bit. So, this is Hetex. Hetex is the Hobby Everly Telescope Dark Energy Experiment. Uh, we came up with this idea, in, I mean, I, so just to tell you how projects work, I came up with this idea in 2002. <laughs> it's 2021, I don't even know anymore. Uh, that's almost, that's gonna be 20 years next year. Um, it is crazy how long 
uh, a, a big project takes to develop. Uh, we, we really didn't start building until like 10 to 12 years ago, um, but now we're a full steam. It ended up being a $42 million project. Uh, we came up with it here at Texas. It's mostly our, it's all our telescope. It's mainly financed by a Texas, uh, a Texas A&M, uh, Oxford's in there, and then a bunch of German institutes. We got some support from the National Science Foundation, the Texas Advanced Computing Center. So in a nutshell, what we're doing is we're taking one of the largest telescopes in the world, and that's this telescope here. This is the hot, so, so this is a cutout of the Hobby Eberly, uh, the Hobby Eberly telescope. It's a 10 meter telescope. So it's in the top five optical telescopes in the whole world. So we take the biggest telescope, we built the largest spectroscopic instrument, which means we take the light and we divide it into its constituent wavelengths. And this is how we get how far away an object is. That's how we get the redshift, how fast it's moving. So this spectrograph is about, it's how you count somewhere about a hundred times more powerful than any other spectrograph. Largest telescope, one of the largest telescopes in the world, largest spectrograph by far. We're doing one of the largest surveys ever done on a big telescope in terms of time, in terms of observations. And then we're using the Texas Advanced Computing Center, which is in the top five most powerful computers, number one for one that a university has access to. So we took these four things and we put them together and we have a crazy experiment. And it's often called that crazy Texas experiment. That's what a lot of my colleagues around the world have been calling it, which I just, I, that's fine by me. Okay, um, so just to hear some numbers. Uh, Head decks by the numbers, we're 40% complete right now, which is super exciting. So I've been doing this project for almost 20 years now. Um, we've been taking data for four, we have another two, three years to go. And people tell me that's so long and it is just a blink of the eye to me. I've been doing this for 20 years. I got three or three more years and we're gonna have a complete survey, it's fantastic. We're gonna have two to three million uh, galaxies I wrote all the data reduction, a, a code in Fortran. I'm old. Uh, all, all the modern uh, code is written in Python. Fortran is so much faster. For those of you who are, are computer jockeys out there, they would appreciate that. Uh, it is so, uh, and, and and so I enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, so I code all day long. If you want to know what I do, I code. Um, so what we're going, our, we, we are on track to make the best measure ever of how galaxies are distributed 10 billion years ago. We have 10,000 fields to observe. That's the plan, we've observed 40% of those. One billion spectra, one trillion resolution elements. So what the code is gonna do, it's gonna, it's gonna search, sift through, and I'll show you a couple of these resolution elements. It's gonna sift through one trillion resolution elements and find galaxies. Okay, so this is the big thing we did on the telescope. We took a, the biggest, tel one of the biggest telescopes in the world and we took it down, we took it down for about 10 years and we put on a whole new top end and we put these spectrographs on the side. The only thing we left intact was the primary. We basically rebuilt the whole thing. It had too small of a field. This is where most of the money went in the project. It's always the case where you have this, you know, you get money for your project, you have money that you that you plan to do for the science analysis, but there's always over there's always overruns on the instrument side and it's because it's hard and you can't have the science without the instruments. So all the money is always diverted. We're doing well with the National Science Foundation, but Still, it was, it was a lot of overruns. What is built, it's done, it's beautiful, it's to specification, and that is fantastic. This is the project that I actually envisioned that I came up with in 2002. It ended up being almost exactly the same, which I was very excited about. So this is the pie chart, which you've probably seen, of what the universe is made of. Okay, and this is what we know now. This is what we think is in the universe. I'll explain why and how Hetex is gonna to try to solve this. So there is 74%, and, and these numbers pluck around by uh, a few percent. Um, a 70 to 74% is in a dark energy, and I'll, I'll talk about that. 21% is in dark matter, and the rest uh, of 5% is in normal matter. And what we are made of, what we live on on Earth is a very small fraction. Uh, that mass is normally in hydrogen and helium and neutrinos, and we as heavy elements are um, a measly 0.03%, so we are completely and utterly irrelevant to the universe, and that's why I love astronomy. So this is, this is dark matter and dark energy. 90, I've always said 95% of the universe is 
in stuff we don't know about. That is remarkable. Dark matter, the problem of dark matter has been around for a very long time. I've been giving talks like this for a long time, and I've been saying for a while, within one or two years, we're gonna measure the dark matter particle. That has not happened. And right now I would say that it might not be a particle and we might not, and we might have to modify the theory of what dark matter is, which is really exciting. Dark energy is even more mysterious, I'll talk about that. But the way we measure these is this model that I showed on the beginning of how the universe expands. We, we look at how the galaxies are distributed. We turn that back in to an expansion and we can explain that expansion by 21% of dark matter and 74% of dark energy. Um, so let me go, it's this, it, it, I'm, I'm gonna show you a few sets of slides that are the same in terms of concept. Um, this is probably one of the more important cartoons that have been shown multiple times. Um, down in the bottom left is, uh, so we have a problem when we talk about the evolution of the universe. We have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time but I have a two dimensional board in order to explain this. And so you have to allow me some leverage in that and, uh, and, and, and try, to, try to understand how these go. So time axis is the one that's along the diagonal of this cone and the space axis. So what we think about, when you think about the universe as a whole, you don't think about the expansion of the universe itself, okay? The universe is, as far as we can tell, is infinite. So, you know, you can't do infinity, I mean, infinity times two is still infinity, infinity times infinity is still infinity. So you can't, it's what we talk about when we talk about expansion. We talk about the average distance between galaxies and the universe is increasing. And then in that regard, it helps you to understand expansion because then you don't care about infinities. What's happening is the galaxies are effectively spreading out in the universe as it goes. So down here, you can imagine, here's the Big Bang, it's the point here, and time is going out, and the galaxies are spreading out. And what happens, and so this is a cartoon. So if you follow, the, follow this a cursor, in the very beginning, there was a sudden expansion, which we call inflation. Okay, and we don't understand that. So that's a new concept, that's a new talk, that's a new experiment trying to understand what inflation is. We're a ways away from, from um, making that work, but very early on, our universe expanded very quickly. And since then it's expanding slowly, but still expanding. Now the problem is that as you expand, <clears throat> because there is mass in the universe, and because we think we understand how gravity works, that a galaxy on one side of the universe, say over here, and a galaxy on the other side of the universe, over here, will have an effect, will have a gravitational effect. The galaxy over here, that's my cursor, will pull on the galaxy over here, and that expansion should slow down over time. Okay, that's the theory. However, <clears throat> when we went out to measure that expansion, it turned out that, in fact, that was not happening. What was happening is that they, the universe was accelerating. That is the expansion was getting bigger. This is the term we call dark energy. We live, our, when, we, where we, when we live in the universe, 13.8 billion years after the universe began, we live at this transition point between when a gravity slowed things down and when it began to expand out. So we're, at, we're living at this inflection point when, the, when a dark energy is beginning to take over. That makes no sense. I'll come back to that later. Okay, so just hold on to that thought. So um, history of dark energy, uh, 1919, Einstein proposes an acceleration based on he had bad info from the astronomer. A brilliant guy, but if you give a brilliant guy bad info, you're gonna get the wrong answer. So he came up with the idea of, uh, of dark energy uh, 19, 10 years later, 1929, Hubble discovered that the universe was both larger and expanding. Einstein was actually embarrassed and retracted his idea of dark energy. Back then he called it a cosmological constant. Uh, fast forward 70 years, two teams, Rees, Smith, and Perlmutter discovered, got the Nobel Prize for discovering that there is a need for an, ex, uh, for an extra acceleration, harking back 80 years ago to Einstein's idea. 
Today, now 20, 30 years later, I don't even know, 20 some years later, theorists have drawn a blank. Theorists have failed us. They can't solve what dark energy is. We don't know what's going on. I think it's the observers to the rescue at this point to actually try to make finer detail on that expansion rate of the universe. That's where we are. Our, this term, I've said multiple times, they have assured in the, uh, the visitor center that they, uh, they uh, took from me. The, what we call dark energy may not be dark and it may not be energy. What it is, that phrase, dark energy, is a phrase we use that's our lack of understanding of how the universe is expanding. I call it our ignorance term. I mean, it's, it's not, you can't do much beyond that. It's, it's, we don't know what it is, so don't get hung up on the phrase. It was a really clever phrase. It sounds great. It sounds important. Dark energy sounds cool, dark matter. Um, but it is just a phrase, and it's just a phrase that, that demonstrates our ignorance. This is the equation here. This is also on, I think it's on that same shirt. You can get it at the visitor center there. Um, and, and I only put it on here because it is a relatively simple equation. This is why I put it on here. On the left is the observation. So this is the observation for the expansion rate. Keep, keep in mind, this is relatively easy. You have to measure the expansion rate. You measure how far an object is away, how fast it's moving. You do that for a bunch of objects and then you make this model. That's the expansion rate. How much is the universe at a given distance expanding away from us? That's the observation. That's, again, what we're doing in Hethex. On the right is the theory. So left observation, right is theory. 1998, we only had that there was radiation, that there was matter, and then the shape of the universe. And when they did this measurement, they had the observation. That was a measurement that they did. They had the theory with the three terms, and the left side didn't match the right side. In fact, the left side was three times larger than the calculation they had on the right side. And it was a collective, uh-oh. And so what they do, what every good scientist would do, is they added in a term and they gave it a name, dark energy. And that's what we did. That is dark energy. Okay, so now we're gonna try to understand this thing. And this is how it works in Hetax, and I wanna show you a map in a moment. This is the big, this is the big dipper right here. This region here is what we're going to observe. We are going to do this crazy survey, the crazy Texas survey, where we are gonna tile the sky and every little spot in this box right here, we are gonna take a spectrum. We're gonna put a fiber on there, an optical fiber, and we're gonna observe it. If I did a zoom in to here, this is our footprint on the Hobby Everly telescope over on the bottom left. If I did a zoom in in one of these, in one of these boxes here, it looks like this. This is the focal plane of the telescope. I'll show you that in a moment. If you did a zoom in on one of these boxes here, it looks like this little instrument here. We call this an integral field unit, an IFU. This is an array of 448 optical fibers. If I did a zoom in in the corner over here, it would look like this image over here in the bottom right. Each little dot, each little dot there is an optical fiber. Uh, and optical fibers are used everywhere. They're used in telecommunications. And what we do then is we wait, we observe one chunk of the sky, take our data, and we hope that there's a galaxy somewhere in these optical fibers. And we know, we know our density, so we know we're going to get some. And this is a galaxy light. This is a spectrum. So we take that optical fiber, we put it through a spectrograph, and you get an image like this. And this is uh, the peak here, what we're looking at is gas that was generated in a galaxy from active star formation 10 billion years ago. I'll explain that in a moment too. And then what we do is we, so, so here's the focal plane. Uh, again, uh, I want to blow it up and these are actual images of the, uh, um, of the fiber. This is the photon's last view of its existence, basically. So what happens, let me walk you through the story of the photon. What happens is, Long the galaxy, far, far away, there are two clouds in the galaxy early on in the universe, because these are young and early galaxies, and the clouds come together. There's hydrogen in the clouds, because it's mainly hydrogen gas, and uh, they, they uh, collide. The gas excites, is, is excited, and so if you go down to the individual atom, there's a hydrogen atom, and there's, a there's an electron that jumps up in an energy orbit. 
So it jumps in orbit a little bit higher because there was some type of collision or some type of energy injection. Very quickly, that photon falls back down to the ground state in this one atom. And then when it falls back down, it emits a photon, okay? Then, then that's the photon. That photon then starts its travel. Starts its traveling 10 billion, 11 billion years ago. It's traveling through the universe and Things are happening in the universe as it travels through. There's a cluster of galaxies. That photon can be bent around that in its path. Um, the universe is expanding, so the photon is getting its wavelength stretched. Um, and that photon is traveling, traveling, traveling towards our galaxy, towards our star, straight towards Earth. It sees a Texas on the map. It's traveling towards Texas, it sees West Texas, sees the Hobby I believe, telescope, sees this big primary mirror, bounces in the primary mirror, hits the secondary mirror, and then boom, it sees this. It goes into one of these optical fibers here. Since it's sent to a spectrograph, that one photon then hits a charge couple device, our, our CCD, and it's turned into an electron. We capture its charge and now we own it. That's, that's that. And so we get a count of one. That photon has been traveling for 10 billion years. It goes into our detector, turns to an electron, and then we can, we can just run it through our electronics, and then we can turn that into an actual count on a computer. And that's how we get the photon. It turns out that we need about 280 is a magic number. If we can get 280 photons in 20 minutes, from a galaxy 11 billion years ago, we get enough signal to be able to detect it, record it, and tell how far away it is. That's our magic number. Um, and so these are the photons. These are these. these I, this is what this is the stuff I look at all day long. This is this is my favorite images. These are the actual detectors over here. This is the the photon comes in and then it gets spread out according to its uh, its wavelength. On the left side is blue light. On the right side is the red light. And I'm looking for these little peaks right here on the detector. So you're, you're looking a cutout of the detector. There's a peak here. There's a peak here. There's a peak here. This galaxy is about, this is light about 9 billion years ago, 10 billion, 11 billion. I can just look at this and tell because we have blue and red light. And so the farther away it is, the more a redshift it is. And so what my code that we that I'm that I've been working on for a long time now is I just try to find these dots. That's what I'm doing. I'm looking for dots. And then once we get that, I record it and I toss it in and I go to the next object. Okay, so here's some more dots. I'll show you a few dots. These are beautiful horses. These are the dots. I can sum it up to one particular, so I can take all these dots and I can compress it and do a cut through. And this is the cut through over here. And this is the wavelength that we get. This is the full spectrum. This is about 10 and a half a billion years ago. That's what we get. That's what we want. We get a lot of these. Meteors come through. Man, people have been trying to get spectra of meteors uh, for a long time. It's really hard to get a spectra of a meteor because you can't point your telescope. They fly, they fly through. We see meteors all the time, but getting the spectra is really hard. But our instrument is so freaking huge that we get meteors all the time. And it took me a good six months to figure out what it was. We would see these spectra and they would come and go thought it was a plane, I thought it was car lights, blah, 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 and they kept coming all the time. And then finally I talked to Anita Cochran, and she was confused too, and then she and I, uh, we went back and forth for a while, and we said, ah, oh, it's a meteor, and you're looking at the gas, at the iron that's burning up in the atmosphere. So we have lots of meteor spectra. I don't want those, I don't know what to do with them, but there, we have some people who are really excited. No one knows what to do about them because they haven't been able to observe these. So a weekend, if you want meteor spectra, I have a lot for you. Um, uh, here's an extreme object, which I am crazy excited about uh, because we had this huge observation now. And so we are going to find the weirdos. When most people take spectra of data, what they're doing is they have an, an image beforehand. And they say, I want to look at that object or that object or this object or that object. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that because we're just doing a blind survey. We get what we get. And so we get the objects that have almost no one would choose before. And here is one of those objects. This is a big broad, uh, a big broad line, clearly a black hole, and there's no image in here. I call these things a naked black holes. I have been 
thinking about these since my whole uh, career, I did most of my work on black holes. So I'm trying to find, we know that they have to be out there. We know that every galaxy has a black hole. And when two galaxies merge, the black holes will come together. They can orbit around each other. And then they can get ejected through just a gravitational slingshot. So every model predicts this. There has to be these free floating, free floating, say that in three times fast, uh, naked black holes. So black holes with no galaxy about them. No, this is this is the regime of Hetex. And so there's one here that I'm very excited about. We're gonna, we're gonna, and so I have a bunch of students trying uh, to look for these. Uh, so so that's 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 not what we really need for this survey, but um, but there is some ancillary science that's gonna come off of it. So we have a lot of lines, a lot of spectra I go through. More spectra, more spectra, so much spectra. Um, and so now let me talk, let me uh, show you a couple maps. So back up to what we're gonna do in the beginning. This is an observation of the early universe. This is the cosmic microwave background. This is a full sky map of the universe. This is the theory. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to map the observations for how mass is distributed. This is one in the very early universe. Hetax has one a bit later on to what the universe is doing uh, in a theoretical model. So this is how the whole process works is we have observers and theorists. The observers will make the map and the theorists then will put in like modifications of gravity or modifying the Big Bang or adding extra energy. And, and they tweak the theory they, um, and they make a new model of the universe, compare the observations, you go back and forth. That's the give and take. And so this is one of the first maps that I made and I'm super excited about this. I'll show you a few more. So this is the map I showed at the beginning. You as a human are down in the smiley face, down in the bottom corner here when you're looking out. This is a distance, so these objects are, uh, these are these are the nearby objects. I'll show you the distant ones in a moment. Um, so the, and, and what you're looking at is how the universe, the galaxies are clustered. And you see these structures here, these knots and filaments. This is how galaxies are clustered. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We use the clustering of the galaxy to tell us these two points. That is how gravity works, how strong it is, and how much the universe has expanded. So what we're doing with Hetex is we are making the movie. We're making, this is a, as you look back along this, where my, where my cursor is going, this is time axis. And so there is clustering here. And as the universe evolves, as it gets older and older, the effect of gravity gets stronger and stronger. So the universe will cluster more. So what we're doing in Hetex is we're gonna measure the strength of clustering out at the most distant and compare to the nearby. And that's a movie basically of how the universe is clustered. That tells us how gravity works. That tells us how the universe expands. This I made I made this a few months ago, this map here, and <laughs> I tell you, so I just took the data, I've been working on the data, just writing computer code. I took the data, I said, huh, I'm gonna make this uh, large, what's called a large scale structure map, it's called a redshift slice. And I'm gonna plot everything out. And I made this up and I just stopped and stared. And I said, I, it worked. <laughs> I, I, and I mean, this 40, it was a $42 million experiment. And, and, you know, of course you're gonna expect it to work, but until you see it, until you see the data laid out, you are like, oh my God, it worked. And so now what we're doing, now that we have the map, now we're gonna go through and do, you know, some fancy clustering analysis and measure how much is clustered here at large radii to how much is clustered down here. And now let me show you. And so this is the same image there, that's the data. And this is a simulation. And so what we do, we compare this to this, and then we can measure the clustering in the simulation, measuring the cluster in the data. We know what numbers we put into the simulation in terms of how strong a gravity is, uh, how much the universe expands, and we go that back and forth. Now, um, very large scale, so this is what's new. So many um, uh, surveys have, have measured how the universe is clustered nearby. So this little wedge down here where my cursor is, is the same as this here. So now I'm going out to larger scales. So uh, people have measured this before. This is new, this out here. 
this is what we're after. Or these are these are what I call a nuisance galaxies. We're going to measure them anyway. These are nearby ones, and these are the distant ones. Hetex again is a blind survey, so we get everything in between. There will be galaxies in between here in the universe, but they're not generating an emission line at a specific wavelength that we can see. Drives me nuts that we can't see these, but this is the ones we care about. And what you see here, don't worry about uh, these radial streaks and these, uh, these angular streaks. Try to look at the clustering, try to have your eyes smooth out, and what you see, there's almost no clustering here. Whereas if I blew up in, uh, in, in the middle here, you see lots of clustering. Here, you don't see much. And when I first made this, I said, so what I did is I first made this plot and I said, oh, it worked. And then I made this plot and I said, oh, crap, it didn't work. <laughs> what is good? Then, then, you know, it took me like 20 seconds. And then I said, ah, gravity really hasn't kicked in yet. And this is, we, this is 10 billion years ago, right after the universe came together. And gravity hasn't really kicked in yet, whereas it's really kicked in strong down here. And so this is the movie that I'm talking about. This is the region of the sky we're looking at. That's the Big Dipper. This, we have a, another field in the fall. It's looking right in between Orion and Arenanus. And this is the one that I just, every, I, I just made this again. So this is new data. Uh, I just make this and I just stare at it because it, no one's made this map before. Let me show you a bigger picture. And this is what freaked me out. And this is now, I'll get a little philosophical here. So here's the same map. This is the Hetex data here and here. And we're only at, uh, so this is, when I made this, we only had about 25% of the data process. So we're gonna increase this by a factor of four. This is the observable universe. This is that red line I showed in the beginning. This is the observable universe. Our experiment is here. There's another experiment called, uh, called DESI that's gonna be in between. We work with DESI now. They're fantastic experiments, Department of Energy. Uh, they're about a uh, half a billion dollar experiment. So we're a little, uh, we're about a 40, 40 million dollar experiment. So they're gonna fill in this region here. Look where we are. And so I make this plot. This, there are no experiments from the edge of Hetex to the observable universe out there. Hetex is it, this is as far as we go. And there's nothing out there. So we're gonna, we're gonna stand strong for a very, very long time. Um, but this is the thing that freaked me out, and this world gets philosophical. So I love the astronomy because it's so vast, so big. Look, we are about, we are, if you think of us as explorers, we're making this map of the universe, we're about halfway out to the observable universe. And as I said in the beginning, you can't see beyond that. So when I made this, I actually, I'm in, in all seriousness, I got a little paranoid because the universe just got smaller. Because what we're doing is we're mapping out the universe. And we think of the universe as infinite, and it is. But to us, the observable universe, that's a certain size. And so we are at the point, we're about halfway out there in terms of mapping the universe, which just kind of blows me away. And so I look at this sometimes late at night, come home, say, I'm going to look at the observable. I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at this map. And it's just, it's just, it's pretty it's just awesome to me. This is what I love about, about research. Um, so let me, let me jump to how we do this. And this is because I don't want to, uh, I, I, I want to make a, a very important point here. One of the big issues here <clears throat> is trying to vet the sample. We have millions of galaxies, billions of spectra, trillions of resolution elements. So if something Weird is going to happen in the calibration, some weird meteors, some weird optics going to be out there. We're going to see it. And it is really hard for us to calibrate everything. And so the human eye is just remarkably efficient at this. Okay. And so we are trying, in order to generate our catalog of what is distant and what is nearby, we are going to use machine learning. We have a big machine learning program going. But we need a lot of people to calibrate this. And so we get a lot of individuals, we train them. We need to order 100 to a million galaxies catalog by a human, if then we can go to a machine learning and do a refinement on that. So I started this with a small group of 500 grads, 20, 50. We're going up to uh, hundreds. Uh, we run, I used to run these pizza parties. We're gonna start them up in the fall where we get like 50 of the undergrads. 
we had millions of these galaxies, we have thousands of these things, and so we're trying to find a way to merge these things together, and we're getting too small in the university, so I want to, what, um, what I call Astro Tinder, um, and what it is, oh, where's my phone? Oh, so, so what I want you to do, please, you can become a dark energy explorer. So we teamed up with Azuniverse, and I talked about this earlier, and I should have popped it off my phone, where this image will pop up on your phone, and you swipe left or swipe right, if it's distant or nearby. Uh, and so I call it Astro Tinder. My, my dean, I was given this talk about a year or two ago, and my dean got really mad and said, I, he came up after me. He goes, Carl, you can't call it Astro Tinder. He's gone now, he left, so I'm gonna call it Astro Tinder again. So right now, so this is the Dark Energy Ex Explorers. You can find it easy on the Zuber site. We've had, <laughs> we put this site up two months ago, three months ago, and I think it surprised the Zooniverse. Of folks, we've had 1.6 million classifications, 4,600 volunteers, and we've gone through 0.12 million of our of of these subjects. Each one is classified between 15 and 20 times, uh, and and so we're gonna try to get this number up to a million. And it has been it it has surprised me how useful it's been. Of course, it's great for public outreach. I love to get the people involved in this analysis, but. What we're doing is we have an algorithm that tells us what is distant and nearby. And now we have a group of humans who said what is distant and nearby. And it like 90% of the cases, they match well, fantastic. But then in those 10%, they don't match. And now we're going in and we're finding where our fault is. Most, it's, it's about, it used to be in the beginning that the humans were always right and the code was wrong and then we modified the code and now we're approaching that 50 50 time but it's been extremely useful to have the group of people classify this and 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 we've used that we're gonna so this is one so this is our first a workflow of distant and nearby and now we're going to dig into the harder objects and do a real or fake a category if this has worked so well we're going to exploit this as much as we can but we need we need more people uh, to help out. Um, so there's the the big role for Hetex. It's it's an observational a program that get the expansion rate 11 billion years ago. The two major issues are the nature of dark energy and H not measures. Um, and I just you know this is an exploratory program. Hetex is designed to measure the expansion rate of the universe. We did this huge survey, this huge instrument. And um, and and it's it, and I thought of this whole thing as I I treated it as an experiment. Uh, let me uh, stop share for a while, just because I'll I'll just I'll talk for a bit. And I treated this whole thing as an experiment. Um, and and the idea was to make this measurement. And I've always said this uh, to the deans and the provosts and such. We're going to make the experiment. Then I'm going to just toss that instrument off the telescope. The idea is is I want one, this is $42 million for one number, let's say uh, two numbers. So the value of the expansion, the value of the expansion rate and the uncertainty on the expansion rate. And from those two numbers, then we will try to understand what dark energy is. But I know, and I know from all the astronomers that are in the collaboration, again, it is, there, is, there is so much data, it's such a rich data set that we're just trying starting to exploit that now. That map, no one, <laughs> my collaboration hasn't seen that map of the distant of the of the distant universe yet. And it there is so much in there in terms of not just understanding how gravity works on large scales, but understanding how gravity works on relatively small scales inside of a galaxy. Um, and 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 that combined with weird types of galaxies, naked black holes. That image I just ended with is I just had to show the, the, uh, the black hole in M87. It's one of my favorite objects. I measured the mass of the black hole in that object, so I was very excited. Um, but so where we are now, 40% of the data is in. Two or three more years, we'll be done with all the data. Uh, we will probably have a result within a year from now. So because the way the results go, is, the way the analysis goes, is you only gain by the square root. So we've, once we get to half the data, once we get to the full uh, data set, we only improve by uh, about 40% in terms of the analysis. So we should have a result if there's something interesting in about a year from now. 
Whether or not we go out to the press, we don't know. Uh, we'll just see how it goes, but our full result will be done in about three or four years. So uh, let me end there. Um, uh, I always love uh, talking about the stuff. Stay tuned. Uh, there's going to be a lot more uh, going on. We, we, we don't know what's in there. I sat with some students uh, today where we're going through images. I just cycle through this data and interesting things pop up. And I say, huh, can you go take a look at this and do some study on it? Like one off objects that are out of a million objects. It's just very exciting. It's, it's, it's what research is about. Okay. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to take uh, uh, questions. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Man, that, that was, that was, yeah, for, yeah. Sorry, we got a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure where it's coming from. It might be, it might be the echo right there. Yeah, I think we might have got it there. Uh, so uh, we do have a bunch of questions, uh, Doctor Greg Hart. If uh, if you'd like to take some, uh, there was some really cool stuff. I'm trying to scroll back through here to uh, to Jeremy's question. I found uh, very interesting. Uh, is dark matter axions? Good, good question. So yeah, um, we have, <laughs> so the idea for dark matter for the longest time had been what we call WIPs, weakly interacting massive particles. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and we have searched for those with physics experiments on the ground and we tried to put constraints on their masses from astronomical, uh, astronomical studies as well. And we're almost at the point where we should have detected it on the ground to explain this one particular astronomical observation, and we haven't found it. So the idea of dark matter being a wimp is running out of steam right now. One that's still standing, you're exactly right, is axions. That's much harder to study on the ground. There are some ways we can do it. Uh, we actually have a researcher, a professor, um, uh, a professor Winget in the astronomy department at UT who is studying white dwarfs and you can get a little bit of constraint, it's, but it's really, really hard. You can get some constraint on the amount of axions. Excellent question and the answer is, it uh, WIMPs are almost, not quite, but almost ruled out. Axions are still remaining. Uh, but they're going to be hard to rule out. But it's a good question. Very cool stuff. And uh, there was a few more in here that I saw. Was there one that stuck out to you, Joe? Or uh, do you have a question? No, uh, Martin's question was interesting. Um, it's kind of more of a philosophical one that I don't think we can answer. But uh, I figured we'd throw that up there any anyway. Uh, it's, it is. is or was there a bell on the other end prior to the Big Bang, which is uh, the Great Crunch and then Expansion? So the idea, I didn't, I didn't get into this. Um, one of my favorite ideas philosophically is the multiverse. Okay. And um, um, it's, it's, I, this is more of philosophy, not so much a science because I try to make a hard line between um, what you can prove and what you can't prove. If you can prove it, in in with some type of observations, I'll call it science. If you can't prove it, you know, and I get into arguments with my colleagues, then I don't. It's still interesting. I love it, and I'll still read it, and I'll study it. But I'll call it more philosophy. I'll even call it a religion sometimes. But that would really piss off my colleagues. But um, <laughs> but the the multiverse, I'm really attracted to philosophically. There are and and so to answer uh, Martin's question is that is one idea out there that. We have this, this, this infinite sea of bubbling space-time, and you get these uh, pockets of energy fluctuations where a universe comes into existence, and most of them are small enough, they pop into existence, and then they collapse back down. Every now and then you'll get a universe that can expand a little more. Maybe it has a little extra dark energy in there, or maybe it has a little um, less matter and, and a lot of energy so it can expand out. Maybe it has uh, too much matter and collapses back down. But every now and then, because the multiverse is infinity, you will get some a Goldilocks universe like ours that has the perfect amount of dark energy, the perfect amount of dark matter, the perfect amount of inflation, and we stick. And so you make a universe. And so prior to the Big Bang then would be 
this bubbling space-time continuum all over, and we just happen to be one that, I mean, we can only, we can only live in a universe that allows us that exists, right? We can't, right. We can't live in the universe <laughs> with no matter, right? And so, and, so, and so, of course, we would live in the Goldilocks universe by definition. We don't have an, we don't, we don't, we can't have the alternative. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's one a potential, what I would call philosophical alternative to what goes on uh, before the Big Bang. Excellent. Excellent. And do you have another a time for maybe another question yeah, or two? Of course. Uh, our good friend Deborah Moran asked, is dark energy possibly geometry, something like water approaching waterfall? Yes. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, water approaching waterfall, it's interesting. Um, yeah, that's that. I'm, I'm I'm trying to make that analogy work, but let me say so. Yes, there I, there was a term in that equation that maybe you've memorized that there one of those terms was uh, the curvature of the universe. Mm -hmm. If the universe is curved, and if the curvature possibly changes, which is a hard one, but who knows? You know, then yes, you could have this expansion not. So the waterfall analogy is actually a pretty good, I would use like a fire hose or something like that. We're right. expanding out like that. And it's not because gravity is different or anything like that. It's because space time is curved differently. And so, yeah, that's a very a good analogy. There's, there's one that's related, which I like is called what we call the Hubble bubble, which I like. And that is <laughs> imagine our observable universe. Okay. It's, it's related very much to uh, Deborah's question. Um, you have this observable universe. We can't see beyond it, okay? So because uh, because the speed of light is finite, but we can see a galaxy just at the edge. Oh, I have my bar grid here. Um, so if you have this observable universe, say you had a giant structure right here, big big cluster of galaxies, lots of mass, and there's a galaxy right here that we so we can observe this galaxy. We can't see this because beyond the observable universe, but this galaxy, because this is so massive, feels the pull of that galaxy. So it gets a little extra pull. And if we don't know that this galaxy exists, then we say, oh, this galaxy is expanding faster than what we think it should be. Not because of anything special like dark energy or modification of gravity, but because there's a thing that we can't see beyond it. Now, so imagine there's a sphere now and we live in like a hole. We live in like a divot, which is fine. You know, there's gonna be fluctuations. And so we're at kind of the middle of a divot. And so all the galaxies at the end are expanding away, and we call it this weird expansion. We, ter we term it a dark energy, and it's nothing more than a weird a distribution of space-time. Of and so that in that case, that's exactly a geometry. So that's a perfect question. Oh, excellent. Um, and then last one, if you're okay with it. We had a lot of questions, but I want to be mindful of your time. Uh, Walt Cooney had asked, uh, how does the dark energy survey overlap and differ from HETDEX? Okay, so there's a couple dark energies. So there is, there is a, so when I started Hetex a long time ago, there was probably uh, 12, 12 to 15 experiments out there. Uh, there's only like two or three left standing. Dark energy survey is one of them. Um, that one is done taking data. That one is relatively nearby. So the expansion of the universe, his expansion of the universe again, uh, so, so DES, the dark energy survey, is only looking out to about this window. A DESI is looking out to about this window. This is the DES. The, this is a DESI. We are way out here. We are out in no, in no way, in, in no person's land. Um, and what is special about that is that, so they're going to nail, so the dark energy survey and DESI are going to nail how the galaxies are clustered in the late universe, the older galaxies. We are gonna nail how the galaxies are clustered in the early universe. That's why I, we did this because we knew that the dark energy survey and DESI were happening. We knew that was gonna happen. So I didn't, I wanted to push through. So the whole philosophy was to go to a regime which no one has looked before and that's early in the universe. And then it's that connection between the expansion rate early on and the expansion rate nearby, that's where the models for dark energy works. And so that's, it's, it's a very, so it's a very important um, overlap. Excellent. 
Well, Dr. Gephardt, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, like I said, I've heard you speak before. I thought it was a fascinating discussion. Uh, and you make things simple for folks like us who don't have a PhD in astronomy or physics to be able to understand. Uh, and, and of course, it asks, you know, it begs more questions afterwards, but uh, absolutely fascinating talk. And we're going to share with everybody where they can uh, participate in the citizen science portion of this in just a second. But uh, really appreciate you joining us tonight and uh, wish you continued success and look forward to seeing all the wonderful data that you guys are producing. So thank you. It's always a, it's, it's always a pleasure to talk about it. So, so great. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Have a great weekend. All right. Take care. Awesome. Fantastic stuff there, y'all. I mean, it's just fascinating to hear uh, someone of Carl's caliber come in here and just lay it down for us uh, exactly how it is. And, you know, we're going to be, Carl's going to be famous, already is famous. I think yes. they're going to find it. I think they're going to find the answer. And uh, I'm just excited to be a, a small part of it as a Texas resident. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything, right? But, I, you know, I just want to say, look, will you come back and talk to us uh, when you guys win the Nobel for, for your research there? So. <laughs> Absolutely. We'd love to have him, uh, you know, and, such a fascinating talk and we missed a lot of great questions guys we apologize for that we want to be yeah. mindful of the speaker's time i had i have several questions but uh i definitely i have his email so i'm probably going to throw a few away <laughs> so uh, yeah well uh look you know to accommodate dr gebhardt's schedule we pushed back some of the giveaways will i don't know what you want to think give stuff away stuff away okay all yeah. right let's uh let me get this up here ready to go for everybody it is the continuation of the great Texas giveaway. And uh, unlike a normal TSP where you must be present to win, here you must be socially distanced to win. So let's go on and, and uh, give away some prizes. So the next prize that we're going to give away is a $50 Amazon gift card from, again, the Houston Astronomical Society. It's great folks there. And the winner is Fred Tenney of the Colony, Texas. So congratulations, Fred, on winning that $50 Amazon gift card. Fred Tinney, is that Gazer Aids? Is, is that the same Fred? Is it? I think it might be. Congratulations. Awesome. If it is, that's awesome. Excellent. So the next door prize is the book, A Night Watchman's Journey. I'm, I have it right here. This is the very one that's going to go out to uh, the person that wins. It is autographed by David Levy. Ooh. I had the opportunity to meet him last uh, Valentine's Day. I spent Valentine's Day with David Levy. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, that'll be going out to the winner. And that person is Terry Van of Fairfield, Texas. Congratulations, Terry. By the way, um, our speaker, one of our speakers for tomorrow is David Levy himself. So uh, it's, I think it's an appropriate gift given yeah. uh, who we have speaking to us. And very generous of you, Joe. Thank you for doing that. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. I know Terry, and I know he'll enjoy it. So excellent. Excellent. All right, we've got another set of Poro Prism binoculars, some 7x50s from our friends over at Vixen Optics, Star Guy, and Berlebach. And the winner of this uh, door prize is Jeff Ghost from Aptos, California. We've got another winner in California. Congratulations, Jeff. Awesome. And from our friends at Sivani, we've got an 80 millimeter achromatic refractor package. Nice, very Sweet. nice. And that is going to John Lamont of El Paso, Texas. So. Probably uh, the person closest to the Texas yeah. party out in the uh, west, out west town of El Paso. <laughs> yeah, congratulations, John, for winning the uh, 80 millimeter achromatic refractor package. We also have a uh, another fifty dollar AstroZap e gift certificate, and the winner of that door prize is Eric Faust from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I thought I saw Eric in the uh, chat there. I may be Get mistaken. Here? Yeah, maybe right. so. Maybe okay. I'm sure they'll chime in if they are, if Eric's out there. Yep, absolutely. Okay, Savani has given us also a nine millimeter, one and a quarter inch eyepiece to give away. We can never have too many eyepieces. And the winner of this is uh, David McCoy from Plano, Texas. Congratulations, David. And uh, we've got, and these things are awesome. You saw the ad earlier, uh, Celestron Power Tank, Lithium Pro. The winner of this door prize is Donald Bradford of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Congratulations, Donald. Yeah. That's a beautiful piece. I have that one as well. Uh, those things are amazing. I'll run my scope for like four or five, six nights straight without having to recharge it on that thing. It's amazing. 
Absolutely. And uh, we're going to give away more prizes here in just a moment, but we figured we would let uh, you all hear from some of our sponsors and advertisers, I should say. And uh, bear with me one second. Well, you, you know, you were talking about the Celestron yeah. power tank. How long They're, have you had that? Oh, man, I've had, well, I have like almost all of them, like all the different versions that they, they release. I have the big, the middle, the small. Uh, and I've had, since they released it, I was like, that's a, that's a, a must do. Uh, and I don't regret it because again, uh, I use that thing all the time. I use it more than like shore power for my telescope, which is, <laughs> cool. but it's so convenient to strap it on the leg of the, the equatorial mountain, let it roll, you know? Absolutely. And I apologize. I'm having a hard time bringing this up here, but, uh, that's all right. We got plenty of other stuff coming guys. We have a trivia contest in a minute. Uh, so you're not going to want to miss that because you still yes. have a chance to win some awesome stuff. We're going to give away another shirt here in a few minutes as well. Uh, so there's plenty of time to, uh, to win some more stuff. And again, these drawing, these door prizes are for the past TSP attendees, but there's plenty of chances for you guys in the chat to win, uh, lots of trivia. I know Debbie, uh, Debbie Moran is ready for that next trivia, uh, content because yeah, she, she's, uh, she is mopping the floor up with uh, with those answers. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Hey, well, uh, we're ready to go, and I uh, wanted to let everybody get a, a little bit of an experience of where we do these um, star parties, and uh, let you hear about the ranches. Well, there's a shot of the T-shirt. If you guys are <laughs> that. Um.
and we're back from yeah, our we're, breaks. <laughs> it's awesome commercial breaks, man. I mean, uh, you know, that one was made by the Chili Scopes people. We put together a few of them, and uh, just fun, man. It just it feels like uh, feels like we're a professional setup here. Maybe that's it. <laughs> but again, you know, the X Bar Ranch, the uh, Prude Ranch, the folks over at Chili Scope have been wonderful um, advertisers and and have given us some wonderful things to give away to everybody. And we're going to give away some more stuff. So. Yeah. Uh, let me know when you can see that. There it is. All right. Uh, next door prize donated by the Texas Star Party is a $50 Amazon gift card. And the winner is Joe Hudson from Longmont, Colorado. Congratulations, Joe. All right. I, I want a $50 Amazon I know, gift man. Why card. You? <laughs> <laughs> Neither you nor I have won. Here no, we yet. haven't, no. <laughs> There's still hope. Next door, yeah, there is. Keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, next door prize is a Hubble Optics Hubble Five Star Artificial Star. The winner is Dan Clark from Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Congratulations, Dan. Congrats. And then uh, Celestron Power Tank Glow Five Thousand. Winner is Mark Spearman from Wheel Lock, Texas. Congratulations, nice. Mark. Yeah, that's very nice. Absolutely. Another pair of 7x50 Poro Prism binoculars from Vixen Optics Star Guy in Berlevoc. Ah, look at that. Renee Gadaly from the Woodlands, Texas is the winner. Congratulations, Renee. Renee. All right. I know she's going to use that for outreach. I bet you so. <laughs> and we also have another 7x50 Poro Prism uh, binocular set from Vixen Star Guy in Berlevoc. Winner is Daniel Chavez from Concord, California. We had a lot of representation from... Uh, california this time around so that congrats everybody to to uh those who won and uh we look forward to giving away more prizes tomorrow night absolutely uh we've got a few more prizes to give away so stick around for tomorrow night again there's another trivia thing tomorrow night we got giveaways tomorrow night and we'll have uh david levy with us which is going to be epic uh the one and only david levy and we'll have yeah. hummel with this as well and also another thing that ends tomorrow night joe Mm -hmm. is a virtual texas star party auction and, that's it uh there it is right there guys and um we do have a banner with the website which i'll throw up right now there it is that's the website you want to go to if you want to be a part of the auction now we do have a, a two-night three-day stay at the x bar ranch you can see it there oh i see that number is increasing that means uh -oh. people bidding um and we have the same sort of stay, uh, but at a different ranch, the Prude Ranch, a three, two night, three day stay uh, for a winter weekend stay at the Prude Ranch. And both of those are on there now. You can use the link below to go bid. And again, you're going to get a crazy awesome deal uh, if you win this auction. And like Joe said earlier, the money goes to the Texas Star Party to help us make a better event and to uh, maybe do more stuff like what we're doing here from the ranch in the future. Who knows? Uh, but that is an option for you guys that want to, um, to get in on that. And, uh, again, Joe, I think, uh, that's something I want to bid on. Again. Yeah, no, give me one second here. Let's, uh, <laughs> go ahead and bid on that. <laughs> yeah, let, me get it. let me step on in here and get that. <laughs> yeah, but, but like you said, okay, well, you know, uh, for, for those who haven't had a chance to, to bid on any of those items yet, get in, it's going to be a madhouse, uh, you know, take advantage of these wonderful gifts by both the X bar ranch and the prude ranch. And, uh, you know, see if you can win those prizes and get out there with your telescopes. Yeah. And it's worth it. Y'all. I promise you it's worth the price you're going to pay to stay at either of those ranches. Even if you just go, you know, during new moon on, on your own, I promise you, you won't be disappointed in both of those places. Very astronomer friendly, both of them. Uh, and I guarantee you, you'll have a good time. Yeah. And, um, so, no, I guess we're going to the next thing, correct? Well, I was going to say, look, if you don't win one of these auction prizes and you're looking for an astronomy-themed trip, uh, there's no better place to do that than through Sky and Telescope uh, trips themselves. So Sky and Telescope puts on a number of astronomy-related trips throughout the year. A lot of them are focused around things like um, uh, eclipses, right? There are several eclipse trips. There was just an eclipse yesterday that they, they were up on an airplane to watch the annular eclipse. And it seemed like a pretty fantastic uh, event. Kelly okay. Beatty is the person from Sky and Telescope. He's a senior direct, uh, senior editor there, I should say, and uh, does a lot of these trips, Does puts a lot of time and effort into planning these things. 
and uh, it just puts out a fantastic event time after time. And Will, you and I had a, a chance to catch up with him the other day, and, and we, share we shared that yesterday, but we figured it'd be a, a great opportunity to share it again with our viewers tonight. Uh, to see what goes into these sky and telescope tours and what all they offer. So um, this is Kelly Beatty. Welcome everybody. We're here with Kelly Beatty, who is a senior editor with Sky and Telescope and the man who puts together all of the Sky and Telescope tours. Kelly, how are you? Hey, it's great. Great to be with you. Wonderful. We're glad to have you with us. Hey, uh, we've heard a lot about the Sky and Telescope tours. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what these tours are and, and what goes into creating a tour? Sure. And I'll use the one that's coming up in just uh, on, on Thursday as an example. It's an annular eclipse of the sun, but the path starts in Canada and heads off, you know, over the North Pole to Siberia. Not a lot of people are going to see it. In the Northeast, it'll be a deep partial eclipse. Two years ago, I started planning to fly a plane into the path of the annularity so that a few dozen people with us on the plane could uh, could see it. And it's it's taken a long time, a lot of work, but it's coming to fruition. And we're going to be leaving from Minneapolis before dawn, uh, fly over southern Canada, see the annular eclipse and uh, and then set back down in Minneapolis after a flight of about three hours. That flight has been two years in the making. and. That's kind of the, the cadence that we work on in planning the tours at Sky and Telescope. Now, there are some tours that we are doing every year, like we do an annual tour to Iceland. Uh, and in fact, the picture that you see behind me is my background. I took that picture in 2019. We had an exceptional year of auroras that year. And as you might know, we're coming up on solar maximum in just a, a three or four years. So it should get pretty good. That's a tour that's pretty easy to set up because it's kind of plug and play. But this eclipse flight or or taking people to, uh, you know, to the Yucatan Peninsula for an eclipse or Easter Island, all of those are coming up. Those take a lot of careful coordination. We have a couple of companies that we work with that we really trust and, and are happy with that provide the very best accommodations. And it's 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 a lot of work, but it's very fulfilling. Absolutely. Now, with the pandemic, uh, you know, obviously having hit the entire world and uh, people staying away for travel for quite some time now. And, you know, thankfully, it looks like we're starting to emerge from that a little bit. What's the demand look like for uh, astronomy based or space based uh, type of, of travel? Well, like a lot of travel, I think there's plenty of pent up demand, not only because people are tired of being locked up and they really do want to travel again. But also because a lot of people had trips planned that they ended up not going on, they didn't spend that money. And a lot of people we find on our tours are sort of, you know, baby boomers who have lots of free time, they're still adventurous, they have a lot of um, um, disposable income, and so they're, they're willing to go on interesting trips. And, and you mentioned the pandemic, were it not for that, I would just be coming back from a 10 day tour of Italy. Uh, where we go to, uh, you know, Galileo's birthplace and go visit the meteorite collection at the Vatican Observatory. And, and that's been rolled over to next year. So the, it, it's true. The pandemic really hit us hard, especially like the total solar eclipse last year in December. Oh, I just it's, it's painful to even think about. <laughs> right. there'll, there'll be more eclipses. Right. And there, there are more opportunities. And, and so we're actually kind of front loading our tour inventory, if you will, with lots of places to go, not just for eclipses. We have tours planned for South, uh, for Botswana and Hawaii and Australia uh, and Italy, I mentioned, all of which are, are not connected to any particular event at all. They're just wonderful places to go. Wonderful. And uh, for somebody who's looking to do one of these tours for the first time, what's the best bit of advice you can give to one of those first timers as, as they uh, embark on one of these tours? What we try to do, you know, there's an always an astronomical component to the tours, be it an eclipse or or like Vatican Observatory, but we, we're not like, it's not like a, a march from observatory to observatory to see everything we possibly can. People go to see eclipses often because they're in a place where they've always wanted to go. Chile in South America or Hawaii or 
there's a, an eclipse coming up in Easter on Easter Island, and who hasn't wanted to go to Easter Island, right? And it, it provides a convenient opportunity to to make that dream come true. So we we make it a well-rounded set of activities, not only for the, the you know the 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 uh, diehard stargazer in the family, but maybe the spouse who might may or may not be as interested, or whoever is coming along. And that way, it, everyone has fun. The thing about eclipses, in particular, solar eclipses, you know, it, it, you're in, you're dependent on the weather, and so we want to make sure that the tour itself is is very satisfying and a great experience, so that the eclipse, although the highlight of the tour, it's not a make or break situation. If you, we happen to get clouded out, we still have a great tour. Excellent. Well, I know you had a question you wanted to ask as well. Yeah, you know, uh, you've been to uh, a couple of Texas star parties, I think, right? And uh, I, I was wondering, you know, because I, I, I seem to be the guy that asks this question of all of our guests, but I'm, I'm interested in this sort of direction of the thing. Like, uh, what is one thing you took away from the Texas star party? I know you called it the, the land of large daubs. The land of the giant daubs. I yeah. mean, and, and, and why not, right? You're going to take advantage of, of the, the, the clarity and, and the utter darkness of that location. You might as well bring as much glass as you possibly can to see all the things that you've, you've read in books, you know, like the Herschel 500 list and things, things that you've never been able to see from your home because of light pollution or lack of aperture, whatever it might be. And here it's like the mecca of big telescopes and dark skies. And so I have not been to TSP in a number of years. I am itching to get back. We hope Excellent. to get there soon, man. Uh, we're, we're hoping to all go back too, uh, you know, with the whole last couple of years having to cancel, of course, it's not been that fun. And so hopefully you can join us out there, maybe have a sky and telescope tour, bring some people to Texas star party, and then we can all just have a good time out there. That'd be pretty cool. In interesting. You should mention that because of course we have a tour to Texas for the eclipse in 2024. And we thought about making our way out to McDonald Observatory in Fort Davis, and we're still working on that possibility. Uh, we'll be there, and you won't, because you'll be in the path of the eclipse somewhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, last question I've got for you, Kelly. Um, you've obviously traveled the world to observe a lot of these wonderful uh, astro astronomical phenomena and uh, had an opportunity to see a lot of the sites and, and, and whatnot. Is there something that's still uh, on your bucket list that you would like to do that, that you haven't done yet? Uh, at, in terms of visiting places in the world and with an astronomy band? Yes. yes. It's coming up this December. Uh, Sky and Telescope has a tour uh, to see a total solar eclipse. The only places you can see it are Antarctica. Wow. Uh, too cold, I'm sorry. And, and out in the middle of the ocean. And so I'm going to be on a cruise ship uh that as you know it's summer in the southern hemisphere december is and mm -hmm. so there are a lot of cruise ships and, and this particular cruise as many will uh will get to set foot on antarctica i get to play with the penguins and that is definitely on my bucket list and my wife she would not be denied she is definitely <laughs> coming along and we're really looking forward to that one cool wow. excellent all right and for anybody who wants to get more information about these tours where can they go uh just our sky and telescope website skyandtelescope.org and uh, there's a nav button at the, on the home page, big one that says tours, and just click. We've got 10 active tours right now uh, with uh, two more that I'm about to load that I, I can't tell you about. But uh, OK, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a great selection and I, I encourage people to have a look. And, you know, if they have questions, fire off a message to me, kbd at skyandtelescope.org, and I will happily get back to you. Excellent. And they can follow you online. Uh, you've got a podcast as well that uh, people can subscribe to. I, I do. It's a once a month pod, podcast, basically for beginners, you know, for people who, who are just getting uh, an understanding of the sky. It's like 12 minutes long, no equipment required. Just as I say, just bring your curiosity, in my podcast and I'll, and I'll show you the night sky. Excellent. Well, Ke Kelly, we really appreciate everything that you're doing. I uh, can't wait to participate in our first Sky and Telescope tour. That's something that uh, I was hoping to do uh, this past year in Chile, but uh, obviously wasn't able to do that because of COVID. But we look forward to all the wonderful things that you and your team are putting together. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's my great pleasure, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Take care. Take Bye. care.
man, you know, Kelly's such a cool guy to talk to, you know, he's just he really he's, is. A, a great guy, really laid back, super approachable. So we're, we're excited to have him as a part of our program and excited to have sky and telescope with their tours, man. This is, you know, something I've always wanted to do like you and I talked about and um, it's, it's on the agenda, man. I think I might have to make one of these work. I mean, you look at where they go, Botswana, um, Antarctica, Antarctica, right? <laughs> Iceland, Iceland, you know, you know Iceland has been on my bucket list forever. Right. Uh, there's no reason, uh, I have now not to go to Iceland and kind of wrap it around an astronomy trip too. Right. So, uh, I just need to make sure to get that done. Uh, but well, I think you know what time it is right now, right? I, I think I know what time it is. It might what be time is it? For some trivia. Trivia time. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, folks, we did this again last night. We're doing it again today. Um, top three winners win these awesome prizes. You can see over here the first prize winner is uh, gets a Celestron Power Tank Lithium. These things are awesome, as Will said. They're, they're fantastic. I'm jealous of whoever wins. So uh, that's going to be the first prize that we give out or for the first prize winner. Second uh, place gets a $50 Amazon gift card courtesy of the Texas Star Party. And third place gets a t-shirt and hat combo from our friends over at Infinities. And uh, man, I kind of want one of those t-shirt and hat combos too. I never, you know, I haven't gotten anything from Infinities in the last year because we haven't been able to go to TSP. But they make awesome t-shirts, awesome hats. And that is the third place uh, prize for tonight's winner. So. Um, well, let me get my screen shared over here and we'll get, we'll get rolling. You know, uh, is going, there's a, no, you guys go to a website, you enter a number, you put your name in there and you're in the trivia contest. And then all you have to do really after that is put your thinking caps on. Cause I know our buddy Don, who's our executive producer sitting in the back room. Well, I can see him laughing right, right there. I can see him laughing. Uh, I know he's probably got some wild questions for you guys and uh those three prizes are incredible this is going to be <laughs> i really can't wait to see if our current leaderboard stands if we get some new new stuff in the mix so we got 10 questions right joe and we have 10 yeah. questions and i'm going to go through the rules over here you know if you were on with us early in the beginning of the show the program uh we talked about what those rules wa were how to uh, play the game, participate in the trivia, and uh, you know, hopefully everybody still remembers that. But for those of you who are joining us uh, later on and haven't had a chance to kind of go through that, we'll step through the rules one more time. So here are the rules. Um, when we give you the code, and you can see it there up there at the top, you'll log in with your real name. Please don't use nicknames. Don't use the name it gives you it from uh, by default. Put your real name in so we can verify you as the winner. Hopefully you walk away with that power tank or one of those uh, t-shirt and hat combos. And um, you know we need to know who you are in order to, to be able to give that to you. Uh, yesterday, we gave you 15 seconds to answer each question. Today, we're giving you an extra five seconds, 20 seconds to answer each question. You do get points for answering correctly. You get more points the quicker you answer those questions. And if you don't answer the question uh, correctly, you answer it incorrectly, you don't get any points. So faster uh, correct answers get more points. And the top three finishers win a prize, as we showed earlier. So we'll give everybody a chance to jump in here. Here's the QR code if you want to go ahead and scan this and uh, join us in the game. Or if you want to pull up a, a you know browser on your iPhone or Android device or your laptop, go to www.menti.com and use the code 35970262. Again, that code is 3597. 0262. And we'll give everybody about a minute or so to jump in here. Um, Will, yeah. I don't know about you. I wish I could participate in this quiz here. I don't know if I would do well, but. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess that's set up by Don. I guess we'll find <laughs> out how well we do against Don's brain. But I just had one question, Joe. Was yes. that Pitbull in that? In that that was Pitbull. Yes. So, you know, I wanted to try to, you know, hopefully get everybody hype up, uh, hyped up here and uh, ready to go for the quiz. But, uh, you know, uh, I am. What's that? Oh, I said there's going to be some good questions, man. 
Yeah, and, and I promise there are no questions about Pitbull. This is all <laughs> <laughs> TSP astronomy themed, no Pitbull questions. Uh, so Don, when you're putting the quiz together tomorrow, maybe we can throw a Pitbull question in there. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good Pitbull reference, but none are coming to mind. Yeah, yeah, same, same here. So we're going to give everybody another 20 seconds or so to jump in. Again, menti.com. Use the code 35970262 or just scan that QR code and jump in the game with us. Yeah. And uh, again, put your thinking caps on because I know, I know Don, you know, he's scaling these up as we go along. And some of them might be common knowledge, but some of them might make you might make you think a little bit. But little again, bit. just bring up your cell phone with the camera, hold it up to that QR code Joe has for us there. And that'll take you directly in to this right here. Yeah, absolutely. We're getting more and more people jumping in. This is your last 10 seconds or so to, to get in. Uh, but again, menti.com and use the code 35970262. And remember to use your real name so that we can verify who the winners are. Okay. And, and Jerry, got- thanks for this and being the thing on knows the pit bull is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to him after the show, Mary Jane, and uh, let him know. So. <laughs> All right. Trivia is starting now. Here we go. Answer fast to get more points. That's the name of the rules here. Thought, uh, thought to be a strong indicator of life, phosphine gas was recently found in the atmosphere of which planet? Ooh. Is it Jupiter, Mars, or Venus? Thought to be a strong indicator of life, phosphine gas was recently found in the atmosphere of which planet? We've got three seconds left. Here we go. Time's up. And most people said Venus. Yes, the correct answer is indeed Venus. So uh, very good uh, question by Don there. And, uh, you know, a little bit of information. Venus, uh, though the detection and meaning of uh, phosphine gas is being challenged, that is true. So, uh, you know, a lot of early excitement about that. And people are starting Mm -hmm. to come back and say, hmm, let's think about this real quick. But, uh, yes, indeed, the correct answer is Venus there. Shocking. All right, let's take a look at our leaderboard. Who took the lead here? Oh boy! Up, oh, Tom Weidman. Oh, the fastest boy. answer there, 975 points, followed by Tom Laskowski and Israel Montessoro. All right, everybody else who's in here, there's still a chance to catch up. This game uh, changes all the time. All right, here, here we go for question number two. Here we go. C-2020 Neo Wise is a long-period comet whose orbit was altered during its recent trip around the sun. How long will it take to return? Ooh, man, this is a tough one. I would have to guess here, yeah. 1234 oh, yeah. years, 687 years, 6,766 years, or 4,576 years. Mm. They still get the you know, if you if if you get this right and you knew it, congratulations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Six thousand seven hundred sixty-six years. Answer oh. C. Uh, surprisingly, that had eight people answer it. So uh, a split answer too, though. Interesting. Yeah. Let's see who got this. Ooh! Wow. Look at Tom. Just breaking up here. Yeah, he's, he's, he's so good. Yeah, and Israel is right on his tail, and Walt Cooney coming in in third place. Walt, Walt congratulations for jumping in the top three. Like I said, folks, th- these things change all the time, so uh, don't ever give up. On April 19th, 2021, a new milestone for powered autonomously controlled flight was achieved. What was the name of the flight vehicle? Was it Falcon Heavy Rocket, Ingenuity Helicopter, Mars Hopper Copter, or Solar Impulse Drone? I know the same thing. Yeah, this is just a couple <laughs> of months ago, right? Yeah. A new milestone for powered autonomously controlled flight. Yes, sir. Curious to see what everybody says. Ah, oh, the bulk of uh, the folks got it right. Ingenuity Helicopter. Absolutely correct. So they Ingenuity all- Helicopter had its first flight on another planet. And Will, I know you and I were watching that intently and, and oh, yeah. really, really stoked about that. Yep, we uh, those answers persevered through that, didn't they? We uh, sure did, and I like the pun there. <laughs> uh oh! Hey, look, Tom. Tom slipped a little bit. You see what I mean, oh, oh. right? But Tom, uh, there's still a chance to to kind of catch up. But Israel takes the lead there. Walt Cooney in second place, and Joe Fregola is in third. Pradeep was the fastest to answer there. So excellent. Nice. All right, we're gonna go to question number four here. Ready to answer. 
Many noteworthy people have subscribed to Sky and Telescope. Who in the following list did not have a personal subscription to the magazine? Was it Johnny Carson, Arthur C. Clarke, Albert Einstein, or Richard Milhouse Nixon? I can't believe you knew the middle name for Richard Nixon. <laughs> I couldn't tell you what Arthur C. Clarke's middle name is. But <laughs> All right, time is up. And 15 people guessed it correctly. Albert Einstein was the one person who did not have a, uh, a subscription to Sky and Telescope. Um, but he did own a telescope given to him by Sky and Telescope subscribers, V. Gazzari. So there you go. I guess uh, he was too busy writing those articles that would end up in Sky and Telescope anyway, right? Right. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's take a look at the leaderboard. Oh, Walt slipped there, as did Tom. Israel extends the lead a little bit. Joe oh, Fragola oh. and Pradeep is in third place. Selsa was the fastest there, so she moves up into fifth place. Awesome. We're seeing a lot of position changes here. And here's question number five. In 1974, Carl Sagan and, and Frank Drake of SETI fame broadcast message to a deep space object. Where did they beam this message to? Was it M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, Globular Cluster M13, Star Proxima Centauri, or M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy? Mm. And there you can see kind of the binary representation of that picture that they beamed out there. Is that three seconds, two, one? Time's up. Most people said Proxima Centauri. No, it is indeed Globular Cluster M13. M13. Yes, I remember. So... That may have jogged the memory at one point had I uh, read that, but uh, Sagan and Drake used the Arecibo Radio Telescope, RIP, um, to yeah. beam the message to Globular Star Cluster M13. So uh, there you go. Awesome. That really is. <laughs> Let's take a look at the leaderboard, see where things have changed. Israel holding strong as is Joe. Building that lead up. Israel wow. Monteroso is at 4,480 points and Joe right behind him. Excellent. So like I said, folks, anything can happen. People can uh, get the wrong questions and yeah. uh, you can come back. So here's question number six. In 2010, Odyssey, two Chinese astronauts land on a moon to refuel and are stranded by a new life form. Uh, what, what moon did they land? Is it Eo, Europa, Titan, or Ganymede? This is the uh, famous Arthur C. Clarke book, 2010, the, the sequel to 2001, A Space Odyssey. Wow. What moon did they land? 11 people answered correctly with Europa. 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 That's actually where the first uh, movie was set, as though the book as well uh, was set. So, uh, ooh, Pradeep didn't get that one. Man, look at the leaderboard fluctuate there wow yeah, yeah israel holding strong joe's closing the gap a little bit tom and walter are starting to catch up as well question seven we've got uh just a few more questions left over here this constellation is named for a mythological hero who used a gory bag of trips to slay a sea monster and save a princess was it hercules Ophiuchus, Perseus, or Cepheus? This is a tough one, actually. Yeah, it is. It is. Constellation lore is complicated, folks. <laughs> Hercules, Ophiuchus, Perseus, or Cepheus? Time is up. Perseus is what most people went with. And yes, that is indeed the correct answer. Perseus, if you've read uh, any Greek mythology, slayed Medusa, used the head of Medusa to kill Cetus the sea monster, and rescue Andromeda. Let's take a look at the leaderboard, see how things pan out here. Oh, Thomas Gowski coming in strong there. Closing the gap. Joe even uh, closing the gap as well. So that... Uh, Man, there is less than 100 points separating first and second place. Yeah. <laughs> We're down to our last three questions. Here we go. What is the nickname for the deep sky object M51? Ooh. Is it the Blue Snowball, the Whirlpool Galaxy, the Silver Coin Galaxy, or the Pinwheel Galaxy? This is 
one of our favorite things to look at, Will. You and I were at the um, X-Bar recently looking at this through the telescopes. We definitely were. Yes. It's still there. I can tell y'all, it's still there. It is still there. All right, time's up. Ah, nice. Most people got this correct. The Whirlpool Galaxy, so Messier Object 50 M51, is also known as the Whirlpool Galaxy. So congratulations to everybody who got that. You know, we're hiding now the leaderboard screen so that we don't see where all the jockeying is. We're going to go straight into the last two questions here. Oh, yeah. This is where it gets tense. Good boy. In 1967, grad student Jocelyn Bell Burnell found the first known pulsar. What code name was it given due to its precisely timed radio signal? Time X1, LGM1, or 12 Seiko? Ooh. I don't know the answer. Bro. Yeah, I remember seeing this uh, a couple of years ago. Leave it to Don to come up with these awesome yeah. questions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Time is up. And, you know, the, the majority of the people got it. Oh, wow. LGM1. Awesome. Wow. So uh, LGM1 stands for Little Green Men 1. Uh, and its timing was so precise, it sounded like a signal from ET. Oh, very cool. All right, last question, everybody. And this is for all the marbles. Well, cumulatively. <laughs> but we're going to get to a set of winners here. And here we go. What was Hubble's 1925 discovery that changed the way we see the universe? Galaxies are receding from us. Universe is expanding. Measured the rotation of the whirlpool in M51. Or measured the first distance to a nearby galaxy. This might be a trick question, Will. I don't know. This is a puppy because it does seem like it could go a few different ways here. Absolutely. Time is up. And 22 people got it wrong. You measured the first distance to a nearby galaxy. That's absolutely correct. And that's why I said it might be a little tricky. Huh? Right? The Hubble huh? constant is, you know, uh, kind of attributed to him. But he did measure the first distance to a nearby galaxy. Don! Sly dog you with that trick Sly, question. Sly dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hubble's distance to Andromeda Galaxy proved it had to be outside of the Milky Way. So uh, congratulations to everybody who participated. But the winner of tonight's trivia contest is... Do -do -do. Oh, it the number. It all pans out. Israel Monteroso, congratulations. You know, he, he held on strong for a good portion of it, lost it a little bit, and came back to win and barely eked out by 15 points. Wow. The win over Joe Fregola. Joe, congratulations. You did an awesome job as well. You win second place. And Tom Laskowski uh, coming in strong third. Our good friend Walt just missed the cut there, fourth place. But to Israel, uh, Joe, and Tom, congratulations. You all, uh, all are winners in tonight's trivia contest. And, uh, Will, do you think we might be able to flash where those folks might be able to email uh, everybody so we can get them their prizes? Will they do that? Let's see. I think it's right there. There you go. So for Israel, Joe Fergola, Tom Moskowski, please email us at BTSP at TexasStarParty.org so we can get those prizes over to you and uh, verify you are who you are. And thank you all for, uh, you know, kind of following the rules <laughs> and making yeah. sure you put your names in there. It makes it uh, a lot easier for us to do that. So let me go ahead and stop that. And again, congratulations to everybody who played and all the winners. Yeah, and great questions, Don. Those are always fun. I mean, you know, uh, trivia definitely kind of breaks you out of the the thing and, you know, makes you think a little bit, which is, you know, we like to think as astronomers, I think. We do, maybe. Maybe, maybe a know. little. <laughs> maybe we overthink the thinking part. I don't know. But at any rate, get down there to the VTSP at TexasStarParty.org. If you're one of our three winners, we're going to match the email name with your name, and we're going to send you – those awesome prizes, which again, I'm very jealous of. Uh, but Joe, I think right now, maybe I can switch it over, switch gears a little bit to where we can give away maybe a t-shirt. If you guys might know, or you guys might know why I'm putting that hashtag mm -hmm. right there. Um, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, but look, you guys might know what to do with that. And if you don't type hashtag Celestron, into the chat and you're going to be automatically entered to win an awesome t-shirt 
designed by our friends, the Obers and Tara Krishansky. Uh, it's a cool t-shirt. It's uh, it's, it's a one of a kind thing. It'll only happen once this way. So if you want a t-shirt, you know, there's a way you can order those. We've been over that too. And, um, you do it, go to texasstarparty.org and you can order the t-shirt there, or you can just type Celestron hashtag Celestron into the chat. I see them coming in, Joe. There they are. Yeah, I see them as well. So keep those coming in. What we're going to do now is, uh, you know, listen to a few of our sponsors and advertisers, I should say advertisers. Uh, Carl's going to get mad at me for saying that, <laughs> but uh, we'll listen to a few of our advertisers here and give everybody else a chance to enter that hashtag that you see there below. Regardless of what platform you're on, we can see where you're putting it in, and we're going to draw one person's name who gets that in correctly. got to spell it correctly. If you're off by you know, even one character, we don't get to see it. And you can put it in as, as many times as you want. You still only get one entry per person. So uh, okay. we'll be back after the ads to pick a winner. Did you know that Takahashi America is part of Land, Sea, and Sky, located in Houston, Texas? Takahashi designs and creates optical tube assemblies, mounts, eyepieces, and accessories for both visual astronomical observing and astrophotography. Land, Sea, and Sky is the distributor for all Takahashi equipment made in Japan and destined for North and South America. You can learn more about Takahashi by visiting us online at takahashiamerica.com. And we're back. Uh, I some something happened, but we're back. Um, And I don't know, Joe. uh, What we should do now is probably hear from, I guess, Explore Scientific, and then we're going to give y'all a few more minutes to get that hashtag. What was it? Uh, Hashtag Celestron. Hashtag Celestron. So get that in if you haven't done that yet. We've collected several entries already. We want to give everybody else a chance to win. So hashtag Celestron. Enter that in. We're going to hear from Explore Scientific, and when we get back, we'll give away a t-shirt. All right. I'm Kent Martz with Explore Scientific. Today I want to talk to you about our Alpen and Bresser lines of really great binoculars, as well as our new giant binoculars. More about those in just a minute. The Alpen Teton 10 by 42 binoculars are spectacular. They're multi-phase coated. They're ED, HD, extra lotus person glass. They uh, have an Abbe prism with special coatings that are proprietary to us. 
that provide clear, sharp, crisp images. Comparing these to binoculars that are just a couple of years old, I was blown away by how spectacular these binoculars are. These Alpen 10x42s also come with the A-lock system that allows you to lock your diopter so that you can set it for what you want and then lock it. It comes with twist-up eye cups and offers a long eye relief for people who wear glasses like I do. They're just a spectacular piece of engineering and optical performance. I'd also like to talk about and introduce you to the Explore Scientific Giant Binoculars. These binoculars are fantastic. This pair is the 120 millimeter pair of binoculars. They start at 70 millimeters and go up from there. Really, these are two 120 millimeter telescopes mounted side by side. They come with the Explore Scientific waterproof 62 degree 20 millimeter eyepieces right here. Independent focus as well as the ability to change the interpupillary distance so that you can set them to your face. These are a spectacular pair of binoculars. The accessory U-mount is available for additional price. And let's just look at down the barrel of these. It's just a beautiful pair of binoculars. I've used them on the sun. I've used them on uh, Orion's Nebula. It is just fantastic to look through these. Now, when I say I use, used them on the sun, we have made safe solar filters for these that come in a, a big oval so you can use these safely on the sun. Because you're using two eyes, it gives you a great three-dimensional view of the sun, makes sunspots look just absolutely fantastic. For more information or to purchase these binoculars or the giant binoculars, go to explorescientific.com. I want <laughs> those binoculars. I was thinking the exact same thing. Teresa said it like, yeah, look at those. Yes. Uh, I can't wait to look through those. I was about to say the exact same thing. Those things, they look fantastic. Uh, you know, I wish we were at the Texas Star Party where a lot of the vendors come out and bring those uh, new gadgets and gizmos that they've worked on and we could take a look through those. But we're here and we're ready to give away a t-shirt, Will. Yeah, I got a t-shirt that we can give away. Well, Don has it. It's not mine. It's not Don's either. It's an actual fresh <laughs> t-shirt. No, uh odor to yeah no or anything none else of like that, that. No coffee stains i've i've been surprisingly <laughs> careful with the shirt and no coffee stains on it which is hard for me that's it i know i know but we're going to give away a t-shirt so for those of you who have not done so yet go ahead and enter hashtag celestron and we will give that t-shirt away here in just last, a second last few last, seconds i see last, last two trees there's yeah. a good uh that's a good you know you're you're more li you're likely to win you're likely all right to win. Here we go. Here we go. Lots of familiar names and faces in there. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> Chaz Hafey. Congratulations, Chaz. Chaz. Or Hafey? Hey, yeah, Chaz Hafey, Hafey. Yeah, one of yeah. them. Chaz, congratulations. You are the winner of the 2021 TSP t-shirt. So if you get a chance, Chaz, you're watching, um, go ahead and email us at vtsp at texasstarparty.org so we can get your details, your t-shirt size, things like that. And uh, we'll make sure to get that t-shirt over to you. There so it is. Congratulations, Chaz. There you go. Yeah. And uh, there's the email address that you can send it to us. Um, what an amazing evening, man. I mean, it's just been, last night was amazing. We yeah. had F back and Larry Mitchell here with us uh, and so much fun stuff. Tonight we had uh, Stephen J. O'Mara, the man, yes. the myth, the legend, all wrapped into one. And uh, Dr. Carl Gebhardt, that, that was a fascinating talk. And I love Carl's enthusiasm and the way he delivers information, man. It just made me want to drop everything and get a degree in dark energy. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I was thinking the same thing. It's like, man, I kind of want to go back to college and, you know, have this guy as a, a professor. I don't, I don't know if he's teaching. I, you know, he's obviously doing research, but uh, no, I've heard him speak before. And, you know, the entire conversation, he was at his desk turning around and just drawing things on the whiteboard like that. And it was fascinating. So I'm glad everybody else had a chance to listen to him speak tonight. It was uh, just absolutely fascinating. He's able to, to take a really, really complex topic 
distill it and condense it down into chunks that we can understand lay people like you and I will. And mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was fantastic. So we look forward to that. And tomorrow we have even more great speakers to, to, to join us, right? To cap it off as a final night of the three night virtual Texas star party event, Mr. David Levy, that guy right on the cover of the book there. He literally wrote the book on being a night watchman's kind of guy. And uh, well, you've read that book and uh, it's pretty interesting stuff, right? It is. David lived a, a really interesting life. Uh, I remember as a kid, I wanted to be a comet hunter. Mm -hmm. And of course, I idolized David Levy. So, um, you know, having the opportunity to meet him per in person was, again, like a, a kid who loves basketball meeting LeBron James. <laughs> <laughs> I was just starstruck. But David's a, a very interesting gentleman. A uh, wonderful person, and uh, I think everybody's going to be in for a special treat tomorrow. And we also have our good friend, uh, Stephen Hummel, who's going to be joining us as well. The man, another man, myth and legend, I guess. Yes. Throwing that yes. monster on people, we might as well throw it on Stephen Hummel. He's uh, uh, a mover and shaker at the McDonald Observatory, and he's a dark sky advocate of epic proportions. And uh, we're going to learn tomorrow why dark skies are so important. I think most of us know, but... Steven's really going to break down the minutia behind why and what's changing and what they're doing at the McDonald Observatory to help change that trend back the other way. Get rid of some of the lights and give us back the, um, like Steven said, the annoyance of a dark sky and how bright yes. the dark sky <laughs> is. Yep. Yeah. So I can't wait for that, man. It's going to be so much fun. Lots of, well, we have trivia tomorrow again. Yes. We have T-shirts that we're going to throw virtually out into the crowd. Giveaways with our virtual T-shirt cannons, all of that good stuff. Yeah. But, uh, that was a fun time, Will. I look forward to meeting uh, again tomorrow. We're going to get together at 6.30 Central Time. Uh, you and I will talk. And uh, you know, special thanks goes out to Don Selly. You don't see him on the broadcast here, but he's behind the scenes making all the things come together that need to come together and doing a lot of work. So thanks, Don, for putting that together. And uh, Will, any last words before we leave here today? Well, all I can say is that it's been a pleasure to be a part of this. Uh, Joe, it's been an absolute pleasure to host this with you. Uh, and to, to just be in the in the same room with, you know, virtual room, but same room with these uh, these amazing people of astronomy. And set a reminder, folks, don't miss tomorrow night because it's going to be the, the cherry on top for this little event. And uh, I can't wait, man. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to have some good times, some laughs and uh some smiles we may even cry a little bit when david tells us some sad stories who knows oh, that, you, you know what i was you know it's like where's he going with this you're absolutely right it'll be a maybe options maybe who yes knows? yes but at the end of the day it'll be a fun time well i look forward to doing it with you again tomorrow and uh for everybody else that's watching with us look forward to seeing you with us as well so we'll see you then yep bye guys